Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is Scottish corporate, corporate body questions. Um, question one, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how many incidents there have been in the Parliament complex since 2012 that have led to police action. Stuart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there is a computerised call and incident management system referred to as STORM used by Police Scotland of which the handling of incidents is recorded. The Scottish Parliament Police Unit provides a police service for the Scottish Parliament campus which includes the landscaped areas and roads uh, around the building. Police incidents requiring the police unit's involvement which occur on the Scottish Parliament campus are recorded on storm. The following are examples of some of the types of incident, although it is of course not an exhaustive list. Uh, protests and demonstrations, photo shoots and external events, high profile VIP visits, concerns regarding members of the public within or outside the building, crimes which have taken place, arrests or detentions of people on campus, road traffic matters, unusual or offensive correspondence. And since 2012, there's been the following number of incidents recorded. 2012, 145. 2013, 180. 2014, 79, year to date. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Thank the member for that response. Could the member outline, in terms of the number of incidents that detailed since 2012, how many of them have led to court action? Uh, and in particular, presiding officer, seek assurances in relation to the member security and the parliamentary security system, particularly in relation to the memo that was sent out by the chief executive on the 11th of June 2014, basically offering training and office security tips for members and staff, should we be concerned? Now, thank the member for his, uh, his sure. question. I know he takes a great interest uh, in these matters. Perhaps I can uh, first answer by a slightly wider issue, is that we have obviously ensured that where there's any instance uh, of security, that we ensure that the, the police um, and our security staff are well briefed about that. And for example, as far as police presence in the MSP buildings, um, you, the member will know that we had some minor incidents in the MSP building and our head of security provided a brief for the corporate body and as a result of that briefing, the corporate body requested that the security office change the pattern of its night patrol regime with occasional assistance from the parliamentary police unit when resources are available. As far as issues uh, uh, to do with prosecution are concerned, clearly this is a matter to do with the, both the police and the fiscal service, uh, but I'm obviously happy to give more detailed answer if the member cares to write to me about it. Thank you very much. Um, question two, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what prices it will set for the proposed pilot of commercial access to Parliament and whether these will be reduced for non-profit or charitable organisations. Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, during the pilot, the, the Scottish Parliamentary corporate body has agreed that commercial events will only take place in the members' room uh, and that will be on non-business days. And to recover all the direct costs associated with these events, organisers will be charged a facility fee for the hire of the members' room, which will initially be set at £1,000 plus VAT. Um, Non-profit or charitable organisations uh, will have the same commercial rates supplied, um, certainly as can happen um, when they have other external venues, they can recover some of the costs by various means. Um, for example, selling tables for their events. And in addition, we have agreed uh, that at these commercial events, charities will be able to fundraise. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It does seem to me that the wide range of events which already take place with a member sponsoring them, where facilities, that the space is provided without a charge, uh, it seems quite reasonable. That's a, a reasonable approach to ensuring that access to Parliament and the status that's attached to holding an event in Parliament uh, is uh, available on the basis of, of support from members for an organisation uh, gaining that access and gaining that status rather than simply having a chequebook. Can I urge the corporate body to reconsider the issues of principle uh, involved in this pilot and the notwithstanding the individual organisations that may take it up the impact on the perception of Parliament simply being available for hire. 
And the Fabiani. Uh, there are a few points, presiding officer, that I'd like to use in response to that. First of all, can I stress for everyone concerned that member-sponsored events are not affected by this at all. This is in addition. Um, could I also say that it is a six-month pilot that we're looking at very carefully and which will be monitored very, very carefully. And the integrity of Parliament is uppermost in all our minds when we look at that. But it is a fact that um, some organisations like charities uh, very much feel that sometimes they're limited in what they can present to their audiences by member-sponsored events during parliamentary time. For example, we would not allow fundraising. We decided that if we're looking at this six-month pilot on a commercial basis, uh, fundraising um, would be allowed for these charities and that this is something we will monitor very, very carefully. Can I say that a very strict mechanism has been put in place to ensure any risk to reputational damage is effectively managed during the six-month period? We'll also monitor all organisations when they booked and whilst I can't predict what individual circumstances will be, there will be appropriate clauses available within commercial event contract that can be evoked invoked that would allow us to cancel such events if necessary. We are very conscious of potential concerns, but we are also very conscious of the demand that is there. And that is why we have put a six-month carefully monitored pilot in place. Many thanks. Uh, question three, Annabel, Go Annabel Ewing, forgive me. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, for that introduction. Um, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what progress the Parliament is making in meeting its environmental targets. The Fabiani. Uh, that's a very welcome uh, question from Annabel Ewing, Presiding Officer, because, in fact, the, the Parliament and the Corporate Body are making excellent progress, and we're, in fact, quite proud of our achievements to date. We've reduced carbon emissions by 30%, and gas and electricity consumption is also down. And this is representing a saving of over £200,000 on our utility bills each year. Uh, this, of course, this, achieving this year's target to reduce carbon emissions keeps us on course to achieve our longer-term target to reduce emissions by 42% by 2020. However, uh, targets to reduce landfill waste and water were not quite achieved in 2013-14. Uh, but sizeable reductions of nearly 70% have been made in the amount of waste sent to landfill. Recycling rates exceed 80% and water use is down by 9%. Many thanks. Annabel Ewing. Uh, I thank the member for, for that response. I'm very pleased indeed to, to hear of the, I think it's fair to say, significant progress that uh, everyone here is making uh, to uh, uh, meet the uh, challenging uh, carbon reduction uh, targets but I would uh, just ask what the next steps are to make incremental progress and I would also take the liberty of asking because my question related to environmental targets in general since we saw the fantastic spectacle yesterday of our bees coming what role our bees may have in, in meeting our general environmental uh, approach thank you Linda Fabiani. Over to you. You know, presiding officer, I thought for one awful moment there she was going to ask me how many bees were in the hives. <laughs> I don't have that figure. Um, certainly I'll find out more about all the um, environmentally wonderful things that the bees um, will add to the environment of this parliament. One of the very special things, of course, is that we are trying to help um, in uh, the, the honeybee problem that there is right across the country and trying to do our bit in ensuring that there um, is a good future for, for honeybees and all the benefits they do bring in pollination, etc. I can't remember what the rest of the question was. I think it was about uh, what we're going to do to, to help improve and reach our targets. Um, there, there are various things we're doing. Um, Annabel Ewing may have noticed that we have made changes in the canteen, for example, to make it much more obvious um, how people can help towards the Parliament's targets for recycling try to make it easier for people to do that. Um, one of the issues we had, as I mentioned, was that we hadn't quite achieved the target on reduction of water. We have changed some equipment and procedures looking to improve uh, and monitor water use in the area to get a reduction in consumption. So we are confident that this year's targets will be achieved, but it's an ongoing process and we should never rest on our laurels at all. Many thanks. Patrick Harvey, supplementary. Thank you. Can I congratulate the uh, corporate body for the progress that has been achieved? Bees, of course, managed to achieve aviation quite sustainably 
unfortunately, Parliament continues uh, to use short-haul aviation uh, within the UK, despite the presence of a, a very af affordable rail service. Can I ask whether that particular issue is under review and whether the Parliament intends, as the London Mayor has done, uh, to rule out short-haul aviation? Uh, Linda Fabiani, a very tenuous link. You don't have to answer unless you particularly want to. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Can, can I say that these things are held under review by the corporate body all the time? Though I did hear my colleague Liam MacArthur saying, I would never get home. And in that, he <laughs> lives in and represents Orkney. I can see his concern. But we do uh, monitor these things all the time through the Chief Executive's report. Many thanks. Uh, question four, Cara Hilton. Um, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what steps it's taken to ensure that it maximises the benefits of digital working. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The corporate body is very aware of the benefits on offer. Our digital programme started in 2013 and we're already piloting more flexible ways to consume our products and services anytime, anywhere on mobile devices. For example, seven committees are now taking part in the committee pack pilot, which makes committee papers easier to read, bookmark and annotate whilst mobile. And we're using various social media techniques to enable the public to engage more easily with business. For example, 11 committees are active on Twitter. Thank you. Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you. I'm pleased to hear that progress has been made, but can I ask um, what assessment has been made of the costs and for an outline of the timescales involved in rolling this out, and also for details of what specific measures are going to be taken to assist the more digitally challenged in adapting to these new ways of working? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the total budget for the programme covering this and the last financial year uh, is £1.286 million. And the programme is expected to run to the end of the current session in 2016. By then, we'll have made some significant improvements in digital working, which will form a good basis for other continuous improvements, most likely as part of business as usual. And whilst, of course, digital working and social media have much to offer by way of a simpler, easier to use and quicker services, it will only ever be part of the way we provide service to members who engage uh, with the public. We will always offer suitable alternatives. Our aim is to be digital by choice, not digital by default. Thanks very much. Question five, Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what security support or device is available to members? David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Security Office uh, is responsible for a first point of contact for uh, members in relation to both physical and office security when members are either in the Parliament building or whenever formal parliamentary business is conducted. The Security Office also provides a first point of contact for general advice regarding personal safety, especially in local offices. More specific advice can be provided by local police officers. The physical security system covers the management of access and control of movements around the building. Office security advice can be tailored to individual members' needs, but essentially covers advice about storing valuables away safely, locking off stores, cabinets and pedestals when out of the office, and introducing clear desk policies. The Security Office, in conjunction with the Parliament's Police Unit, recently ran a snippet session for member staff to raise awareness of office security measures. Unfortunately, there was no attendance for member staff at these sessions, but we run them again before the end of the year. We would appreciate member support in encouraging their staff to attend these sessions. Many thanks. Siobhan McMahon. Thank David Stewart for that detailed answer. It would be helpful if David Stewart could perhaps outline what security and personal safety advice is available for MSB staff based in constituency offices, in particular for vulnerable female members of staff who, in some cases, are working alone in local offices. Um, thank you, President sure. Officers. Uh, new members receive uh, a booklet called MSP Security Guidance advising them on matters relating to loan working for themselves and their staff, which include, and a quote from the document, liaising with local police crime prevention officers, filter security of homes and offices such as door buzzers and panic alarms. Obviously, be very v vigilant of those who are around you. Always let someone know if you're working alone and where that is. And always let someone know your estimate time of arrival, an event or schedule meeting, and when you're finished and you're turning home uh, to the office or home. And on a personal level, President Officer, when I entered this Parliament, I did ask for advice from the Crime Prevention Officer, which I find was first class, and I would certainly encourage members to access local Crime Prevention Officers who are very experienced in this matter. Many thanks. And that concludes questions to the corporate body. And we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is stage three proceedings on the building's recovery of expenses, Scotland Bill. 
In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, the marshal list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any groups of amendments should press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible after I call the group. And so we now move to that business. Um, and I move to group one, um, and which again features Mr. David Stewart. And Mr. Stewart, uh, no, I won't. Thank you. I'll call amendment one in the name of the minister. Um, we'll start with you, minister. Uh, and if you'd like to speak to amendment one uh, and amendments two, three and five as well, please. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me speak to Amendments 1, 2, 3 and 5 and outline the rationale for them. The application of the bill was widened at Stage 2 beyond defective and dangerous buildings. This allows a local authority to make a charging order in relation to the other enforcement powers in Sections 25 and 27 of the Building Scotland Act 2003. These powers cover Building Regulation Compliance Notices, Section 25, Continuing Requirement Enforcement Notices, Section 26, and Building Warrant Enforcement Notices, Section 27. When a local authority takes enforcement action under Sections 25 to 30, they can recover the reasonable expenses from the owner of the building. The exception to this is where they have served a Building Warrant Enforcement Notice under Section 27. This would be when work was being done without a building warrant or was not being done in accordance with the technical aspects of building regulations. In this case, the local authority would serve a Section 27 notice on the relevant person. This would usually be the owner of the building, but it might not always be the case. For example, the relevant person could be a tenant who is doing work themselves or employing a builder to carry out the works for them. Therefore, in a situation when the owner is not responsible for having the work carried out, it is unreasonable for any liability of the tenant to be attached to the title to the related building. Amendments 1 and 2 expand new section 46B1ZC of the 2003 Act. They clarify that the qualifying expenses recoverable by a local authority are only those expenses that relate to a building warrant enforcement notice that has been served on the owner of the building. The effect of this is that the local authority can only make a charging order under new section 46A where the person liable for their expenses for their enforcement under section 27 is the owner of the building. Amendments 3 and 5 are consequential and amendments 1 and 2 they remove subsections 4 and 5 of new section 46C and subsections 5 and 6 of new section 46D. Hope you're getting all this. These subsections make provision for references to an owner that occur earlier in the sections to be read as references to a relevant person other than an owner. The four subsections are no longer required as expenses under section 27.7 are only qualifying expenses and hence recoverable under a charging order where the original building warrant enforcement notice was served on the owner of the building. I move amendment one. Thanks. Now call on Mr Stewart. Presiding officer, uh, the focus of the bill has always been in relation to owners of buildings. The package of amendments ensures that the local authority cannot make a charging order under new section 46A if the person liable for the expenses for enforcement under section 27 is not the building owner, for example, a tenant. They also clarify that qualifying expenses for building warrant enforcement notices under section 27 are limited to when the local authority has served a notice on the owner of the building. Essentially, these amendments are of a tidying up nature, which follows the extension of the bill to section 27 of the 2003 Act, I therefore support the refinement of the bill. Many thanks. Uh, Minister, to wind up, do you have anything to say? No further comment. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move, please. Move. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I think we are. Thank you. Call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 1. Minister? Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. We now move to Group 2. And I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister. Group to the Amendments 9 and 10. The Minister could move Amendment 4 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please. This group of Amendments 4, 9 and 10 can be considered to be minor 
a technical or drafting amendments. The bill provides that where a charging order has been registered, the local authority must register a discharge of an order as soon as reasonably practical after the charging order has been discharged. Amendment 10 is a clarifying amendment which makes it clear that a discharge of a charging order must be registered by a local authority when either it has received the full repayment amount or it has received any agreed lower amount which it redeems the payable amount. Amendment 4 removes new section 46D3 which is no longer required as a consequence of Amendment 10. Amendment 9 simply changes the term the charging order to a charging order in section 46E5. I move Amendment 4. Much, Mr. Stewart. Fair enough, sir. Uh, these are minor and technical amendments which involve some repositioning of provisions dealing with registering a charging order and a discharge. They seek to ensure further clarity and consistency in the application of the bill, and therefore I am content to support them. Thanks, Minister. Anything further to add? No further, thanks. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We are. I now call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister. Uh, Minister, to move? Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And that takes us to Group 3. And I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendments 11, 12 and 13. Minister, if you'd like to move Amendment 6 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please. This group of amendments concern the appeal and registration of a charging order. The Bill adds charging orders to the list of matters that are appealable under Section 47 of the 2003 Act. Where a local authority makes a charging, owner, eh, a charging order, the owner has 21 days to appeal by summary application to the Sheriff. As a result of Section 47.4, eh, as amended by the Bill, the charging order does not take full effect until either the 21-day period is passed without an appeal being made or where an appeal has been made, it has been determined or withdrawn. There have been concerns raised that an owner might use the appeal mechanism as a delaying tactic whilst they try to change the ownership of the building. It is therefore important that a charging order can be registered in the appropriate land register as soon as possible. At stage two, the bill was amended to introduce provisions for future owners to become severally liable with the former owner. These are new sections 46F and 46G. Amendments 11 and 13 are technical amendments concerning subsections 3 and 4 of section 47 of the 2003 Act. Amendment 11 amends subsection 3, the subsection which uh, creates a right of appeal against a charging order and clarifies that any appeal must be made within 21 days of the date of the charging order. Amendment 13 clarifies that a charging order, as with the other appealable matters in the 2003 Act, is of no effect until either the appeal period has passed without one being made or any appeal has been determined or withdrawn. Amendment 6 makes it clear that the local authority can register the charging order as soon as they have made it. The local authority does not have to wait until after the 21-day appeal period has passed or any appeal has been determined or withdrawn. New subsection 3A of section 47 of the 2003 Act makes provision limiting the questions which may be raised in appeals in relation to charging orders. The effect of Amendment 12 is that the correct subsection that creates the right of appeal is referred to in new subsection 3A. I move Amendment 6. Many thanks. Uh, Mr Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, these amendments seek to further refine the appeal system to ensure that it could not be used to frustrate the intended operation of the Bill and clarifies the local authorities do not need to wait until after the appeal period has elapsed to register a discharge. These amendments are in line with my policy in appeals and as such I support them. Many thanks. Minister, anything further to add? No Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And that now takes us to Group 4. And I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendment 8. Minister, if you'd like to move Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Amendments 7 and 8 are the last group and result from an amendment to the Bill at Stage 2. New Sections 46F and 46G were added at Stage 2 to make the new owner and the former owner severally liable for the local authority expenses when the building changes ownership. The first of these, Section 46F, provides, the, provides for the liability of the new owner. The second one, Section 46G, provides for the continued liability of the former owner. Amendment 7 makes it clear in new Section 46E3 that although a registered charging order is enforceable by the local authority against the existing owner of the charged building, this is subject to new Section 46F, which was inserted at Stage 2. 
The effect of new Section 46F is that where a building changes hands in certain circumstances, a new owner is severally liable with any former owner of the building. This maintains safeguards for new owners who acquire right of a charge building within 14 days of a charging order having been registered. New Section 46E4 also makes provision of where, in certain circumstances, a charging order is not enforceable. This section is no longer required. Amendment 8 removes New Section 46E4, which is no longer required due to the insertion of New Section 46F at Stage 2. I move Amendment 7. Thank you, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As explained by the Minister, the Bill was amended at Stage 2 to clarify liability in the sale or purchase of a property where a charging order has been registered. These amendments ensure there is an accurate linkage between inserted sections 46 F and G and the pre-existing uh, sections by adding a necessary cross-reference and removing an unnecessary provision. As consequential amendments, I am content to support them. Anything further to add? Nothing further. Thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you. I now call Amendments 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I would invite the Minister to move Amendments 8 to 13 on block, please. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 8 to 13? As no member does, the question is that amendments 8 to 13 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. And that ends consideration of amendments. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10335 in the name of David Stewart on the Buildings Recovery and Expenses Scotland Bill. Before I invite David Stewart to open the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown Consent to the bill. So I call on Angela Constance um, to speak. Thank you, President Officer. For the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, uh, I advise Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Buildings Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interest, so far as they are affected by the bill, at the disposal of Parliament for the purposes of the bill. Many thanks. And now to the debate. And so I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to, as usual, press the request to speak buttons. And I now call on David Stewart to speak to and move the motion. Mr Stewart, you have ten minutes, so thereby, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, President Officer. It's uh, with great pleasure uh, that I open today's uh, debate. Uh, the bill was introduced on the 30th of October 2013 and concluded stage one with a parliamentary debate on the 3rd of April 2014. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee considered the bill at stage two on the 4th of June, and today Parliament debates whether to pass the bill. It's very much my hope that members will come together in welcoming this legislation and support the bill unanimously at decision time. When I stood in the chamber last to talk about my members' bill, it was known as the Defective and Dangerous Building Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill. A lot has changed since stage one, including the title of the bill, but I believe that change is good. My bill now delivers a more comprehensive approach to local authority debt recovery, encompassing not just local authorities' work in relation to defective or dangerous buildings under Part 4 of the Building Scotland Act 2003, but also their work under Part 3 in relation to compliance and enforcement. An estimated £4 million of debt has been accrued during the time charging orders have not been available to local authorities. As I explained in the Stage 1 debate, prior to the 2003 Act, Local authorities relied on charging orders under the 1959 Building Scotland Act to tackle debt associated with dangerous buildings. However, when the Act was repealed and replaced uh, with the 2003 Act, the, changing, the charging order mechanism was not carried over. This has left local authorities with an increasing debt burden, which needs to be addressed now. Local authority debt recovery can be problematic for a myriad of reasons. A couple of examples given in evidence to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee at Stage 1 demonstrates the diverse circumstances that can be encountered. John Delamore from Midlothian Council talked about the deterioration of a chimney stack that was directly above a neighbouring single-storey property and above a public footpath beside a bus stop. Because of the danger involved, there was a requirement for the local authority to fix the chimney by putting up scaffolding. In terms of payment, he explained, the owner on the first floor was happy to pay, whereas the person on the ground floor was not. Mr Delmore said to the committee, and I quote, 
We are now in difficulties because the person on the ground for who is a business and other property died, unfortunately. Therefore, we can no longer pursue the costs involved and our civil debt recovery methods. And um, while Gillian McCartney um, told us of an example from her council area, East Renfrewshire, she said, and I quote again, we have a site with an absentee owner. I believe he lives in Antigua. The council has incurred substantial costs in keeping the building safe. We understand that the owner is in discussions with several people to buy the site, and we have to continually check to see whether it has been sold. Both council officers noted the advantages of charging orders in these situations as it would have helped them recoup their expenses on the sale of the building. I have no doubt that most councils will be able to recount cases where charging orders would have made a difference. And before I move on to discuss the main changes to the bill at stage two, I'd like to put on record my thanks to those who have helped shape and develop the bill. In particular, I'd like to thank the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for its scrutiny of my policy, the Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee for its continued scrutiny of the subordinate legislation powers, and of course, to those who have worked diligently to support me and the bill prior to its introduction and through its parliamentary stages. I'd particularly like to thank Claire uh, Minnie Smith from Non-Government Bills Unit and Neil Ross from the legal team for all the help and advice. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to express my gratitude for the assistance I received from the Minister for Local Government and Planning, Derek Mackay, and his officials. When I set out this journey, I very much doubted that I would see my member's bill pass stage one, let alone uh, allow myself to believe that one day it would be on the statute book. But I believe that because today politicians have decided to set aside their political differences to collectively address the problem of local authority debt recovery, I think that's a congratulations not on me, but to the Parliament as a whole. I'd like to focus on the main changes arising from stage two consideration. There were three main areas of amendment. The extension of the bill to encompass local authorities' actions under section 25, 26 and 27 of the 2003 Act, the variation of the term of the charging order and the clarification of liability of owners. At the start of the speech, I referred to the change in my bill's title, but the reason behind that actually represents one of the most significant changes to the bill. Local authorities have other enforcement powers under the Building Scotland Act 2003, and in some instances, I've, undertake, I've had to undertake work where an owner does not comply with notices that are served on them under these powers. These powers relate to building regulations, compliance notices, under Section 25 of the 2003 Act, continuing require, requirement enforcement notices under Section 26, and building warrant enforcement notices under Section 27. The bill was extended to provide local authorities with greater certainty of cost recovery when carrying out their duties under sections of the 2003 Act. Action these under these sections may not be as common as local authority action in relation to dangerous buildings, but it's not less important that local authorities have access to appropriate cost recovery tools when they have to step in to undertake work, whether for compliance, enforcement or safety purposes. The second area of change was in relation to the fixed 30-year repayment term. During the course of stage one, it became apparent that a number of local authorities had concerns about the fixed 30-year repayment term, particularly for lower sums. I readily acknowledge these concerns and, as such, brought forward a package of amendments to enable local authorities to determine the number of annual repayments an owner must pay. The bill now provides for local authorities to determine the number of annual repayments. The number of annual repayments must be no less than five and no more than 30. Not only does this change address the point in relation to the size of the debt, it allows local authorities to take into account the debtor's ability to pay. The third area, which I wish to touch on, presiding officer, regards liability of owners. During stage one, local authorities expressed concern that a property might be sold or transferred before a charging order could be registered and suggested that a notice of liability might help it in that respect. On further investigation, <coughs> it became clear that the cracks of the problem was one of timing. It should be possible for the local authority to register a charging order very soon after the work has been carried out. Local authorities should not see charging orders as a tool of the last resort, which perhaps they may have done under the 1959 Act, but should be proactive in their use to secure the debt. In conjunction with the Scottish Government, I looked into the possibility of a registration of a notice of potential liability in advance of a charging order, but found that it was only served to create a layer of bureaucracy detracting from the simplicity of the bill and would have incurred additional costs to local authorities. 
I do, however, recognise that liability might become an issue over the longer term as the property changed hands. And that's why I've brought forward an amendment to clarify liability to ensure that those who seek to avoid their responsibilities cannot. It provides that the buyer for property where a charging order has been registered is to be severally liable with the seller for any unpaid amounts due by the seller under the charging order. I'd also like to mention briefly the subordinate legislation powers. The Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee suggested that my bill should be amended to allow Scottish Ministers to directly amend Schedule 5 to alter the form and content of a charging order, rather than there be a prospect of this being done by way of subordinate legislation. At Stage 2, the Scottish Government decided to make use of the existing powers under the 2003 Act to prescribe the form and the content of a charging order and the discharge. As such, my commitment to address this point has been somewhat overtaken and is now addressed now by other means. I will leave it to the Minister to explain the new subordinate legislation provision at Section 1A that has been made. In conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, the Stage 2 process in today's amending stage has been crucial to ensure that the Bill delivers an effective and modernised charging order mechanism for local authorities to recover from owners sums owed when they have stepped in to carry out work under Parts 3 and 4 of the 2003 Act. Looking to the future and the implementation of the Bill, I understand that the Scottish Government will be producing guidance to underpin the operation of the Bill I will also prescribe the standard form and content of a charging order and the discharge to ensure consistency of operation across local authorities. The bill will be effective six months after royal assent. In conclusion, presiding officer, I move the motion in my name that the Parliament agrees that the Building Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill be passed. Excellent. And I now call on Derek Mackay, Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pleasure to contribute to the debate today on the Buildings Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill. I too would like to thank all the relevant committees for their uh, hard work and careful scrutiny of the Bill. I'd also like to thank MSPs for their comments as the Bill has passed through uh, Parliament and to those organisations that have provided oral and written evidence that have assisted us with our deliberations. Of course, I would like to acknowledge the significant amount of work that Mr Stewart has done over the last four years or so to get the Bill to this stage. As Mr Stewart has already explained, his Bill proposes considerable improvements to the existing enforcement powers for local authorities under the Act. The Bill will improve the recovery of expenses incurred by local authorities under Part 3 and 4 of the Act by enabling a charge for the repayable amount to be registered against the title of the building concerned. The Bill as introduced was targeted at dangerous and defective buildings and I am extremely pleased that it now covers the other local authority enforcement powers under Part 3 of the 2003 Act that is work uh, resulting from statutory notices under sections 25, 26 and 27. Now, under the Building Scotland Act 2003, local authorities must take action on buildings they consider to be dangerous. This uh, might be by taking urgent action to secure the building and the surrounding area, or it could mean getting the building uh, repaired. In extreme cases, a local authority may decide to demolish all or just part of the building. For a defective building, their powers are discretionary, as is the case for their enforcement powers. In all enforcement cases, when an owner has not carried out the work required by that relevant notice, the local authority can step in and undertake the work for themselves. These enforcement powers allow local authorities to intervene. I hope they will be more proactive and, importantly, deal with immediately dangerous situations, stop buildings deteriorating and rectify building work that does not meet a building regulations. Normally, when the local authority becomes involved, the building owner will rectify any problems themselves, but this does not always happen, as we know. Where the local authority decides to step in and do the work in the default of the owner, they can recover their costs, but normal debt recovery methods have sometimes proven to be problematic. So the lack of certainty of recovering their costs could influence whether a local authority decides to do the work in the first place or not. The Government has acknowledged that the existing powers needed strengthening and have listened very carefully to the views of local authorities. And it is clear that any changes must include registration against the titles of buildings. This will alert future owners of any existing liabilities. Last year, the Government included proposals for improved powers in the Community Empowerment Bill consultation, which took a slightly different approach to the Bill as introduced by Mr Stewart and covered all the enforcement powers. 
In January, the Community Empowerment Bill consultation closed and the Local Government Regeneration Committee took oral and written, written evidence on Mr Stewart's bill. The Government also held a workshop with all local authorities to explore the, uh, sets, both sets of proposals. And the common message was strong support for improvement, that repayment terms must be flexible and all enforcement powers should be covered. In fact, Cosler went on to ask, because of timing and other factors, uh, that we use Mr Stewart's bill and not the Community Empowerment Bill. And being the reasonable man that I am, we opted for that course uh, of, of action. As the First Minister said, uh, the Government does not have a monopoly in wisdom, so I am delighted by the cross-party approach that we have taken and from the banging of the the table. I think we've even got a Conservative support in this new uh, consensus between Labour uh, and the SNP. So taking on board all of these comments and the necessary provisions, we're delighted to give the support uh, to Mr Stewart's bill having been amended at stage two. At stage two, there were 20 amendments, four lodged by Mr Stewart and 24 by the government. They covered the key aspects of the bill identified at stage one, uh, including flexibility of a number of annual payments, liability of new owners and the widening of the application of the bill to include local authority enforcement powers uh, as previously described, in addition to the technical uh, amendments. At stage three, the Government lodged 13 amendments today intended to provide clarification and pick up some technical and minor changes following the stage two changes. And these amendments sought to make it clear that a charging order can only be made in respect of building warrant enforcement notice where the notice was served on the owner. A charging order can be registered as soon as it has been made without having to wait for any appeal to be made or determined. And new section 46F of the 2003 Act introduced at stage two will operate as intended by removing inconsistent provision. This means that a new owner will not become liable if they acquire a right to the building within 14 days of the charging order being registered. Delighted that these have all been agreed this afternoon. I would now like to explain some aspects of the bill. The owner of a building is responsible for making sure their building is safe and in good repair. A local authority can step in and take emergency action on a dangerous building or carry out work when an owner has not complied with the statutory notice. The bill allows them to make a charging order to help them recover their expenses from the owner. The order sets out the repayable amount the appropriate number of annual instalments between 5 and 30, and the date each year for payment. This allows the local authority to consider the repayable amount and the owner's ability to pay when deciding on the number of instalments. The repayable amount due to the local authority includes the construction-related expenses, any registration fees relating to the charging order, any administration expenses and interests at a reasonable rate. The local authority must register the charging order in the appropriate land register, which creates the charge on the affected property. Uh, the charging order provides that the repayable amount is to be paid and repaid in annual instalments. However, an owner can still pay the debt in full at any time, or if the local authority agrees, redeem it by paying a lower settlement figure. At that point, the local authority must register a discharge of the charging order as soon as practical in the appropriate land register. The owner can appeal a charging order within 21 days of it being made, and so it will not come into effect uh, immediately. However, the owner may try to change ownership of the building and use the appeal mechanism as a stalling tax. So I believe we have addressed uh, a number of these uh, issues in the course of debate. As I said earlier, the Government fully acknowledges that the cost recovery aspects of Part 3 and 4 of the Building Scotland Act 2003 should be improved. Enforcement is an important part of local authority work and is at the core of ensuring the safety of people inside and outside buildings and protecting the, uh, the, the, the built uh, environment. Local authorities have to invest time and resources when owners do not fulfil their legal obligations, so it is important that they have the certainty that they will be able to recover their costs and their expenses. Uh, the Government will update uh, all relevant guidance on the online building standards procedural handbook and will continue working with all local authorities so they are fully aware of the new provisions. I can assure Parliament uh, uh, these will all be in place in time for commencement of the bill, the, the new guidance six months after Royal Assent, and I urge Parliament to agree the building recovery of expenses Scotland bill. Thanks. Thanks. And I now call on Sarah Boyer. Five minutes. Please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I first of all want to thank David Stewart, uh, my Labour colleague, for choosing to champion this issue. Um, as you've seen this afternoon, uh, for the Minister, 
in another party to propose and have all his amendments both proposed and accepted by the mover of the bill is actually not a usual occurrence in this place. So I want to congratulate David Stewart for his commitment to this issue and for his success in steering both his members' bill through the committee and past the minister and actually for enlisting us all in the process because it is an important issue and I think the evidence sessions held by the committees were invaluable in teasing out the issues from a wide range of stakeholders, particularly local authorities who clearly experience a gap in their powers. And I think in the current financial climate, it's really important that local authorities are not subsidising repairs to buildings that should properly be carried out by owners. So I do want to thank the committee for their work uh, and all the evidence that was submitted by uh, stakeholders for ensuring that in the bill that we pass this afternoon, we will hopefully capture all the sensible contributions that were made in the Parliament. Um, my party is very keen to support this bill and I'm personally both politically and personally keen to support it because of my knowledge of buildings in the city in Edinburgh and Lothians, but also because of the impact across the country. It's important for the character of our towns and cities. It's important for the quality of our built environment. And I think we will all be aware of the message, the negative message that decaying buildings and unlooked after buildings sends out in our local communities. It can have a social and an economic impact. And then there's the issue of safety that David Stewart mentioned. Buildings in disrepair that are not properly looked after can also be exceedingly unsafe, both to users and to the public in general. And in fact, last night I spoke to a members debate on the Rana Plaza disaster, which gives you an, a, a tragic example of what happens when buildings are not looked after and they're not used for the right purpose. So this is a very practical piece of legislation. It's an important piece of legislation. In my region in the Lothians alone, 46 dangerous building notices were issued in 2011-12, and that was just in one year. So I very much welcome the practical provisions of this bill, which will enable local authorities to recoup their costs of addressing dangerous buildings. And I particularly want to mention a couple of the details that the Minister mentioned in his speech that have seen a change from the initial proposals to the final bill we will be passing today. I particularly want to welcome the issue of the change on the 30-year payback issue, which has been addressed in the final bill. There should be scope for the sensitivity of an owner's circumstances. That is something that the local authority should be able to address. It's a particular issue for those on low incomes, and I want to flag that issue up because it was addressed in the equality impact assessment that accompanies this bill. And it's important particularly for people on low incomes who now have a different opportunity uh, in terms of paying back the bill because they will be able to pay it back on the sale of their property. And the change to attach orders to the property rather than the person is important in this respect. It's also important in terms of the amendments the Minister has just successfully moved, particularly Amendment 7, which will prevent owners from dodging their liability, from trying to ignore their responsibility for the building that they will have profited out of. And I think for that, for that reason, it's very good that we were able to amend David Stewart's bill this afternoon. There is currently something in the region of £3.9 million of outstanding debts. Currently, only 50% of local authority costs are recouped. That is something that we need to address. This bill will plug that gap, it will address that problem, and it will ensure that local authorities who are currently cash-strapped will be able to recoup the costs from the owners who have benefited from owning the bill. So I hope we send out a clear message across the parties in the Chamber as a whole this afternoon, that we all believe the owners need to take proper responsibility for maintaining their property in good order. And I reiterate David Stewart's view that the provisions in this bill should be a last resort, not a first resort. I say that with the knowledge of how the statutory repairs notice in Edinburgh has become for far too many owners a first resort rather than a last resort with very negative consequences. Next week we will be debating the housing bill and again we'll be strengthening the scope for local authorities to step in where individual owners won't pay their share. I think these two bills will represent important and beneficial changes in legislation that aim at well-maintained, safe buildings. I look forward to David Stewart's bill being passed today. I look forward to it to becoming law. And I look forward to local authorities across the country being able to use the provisions of this bill in practical ways to improve the quality and the safety of our built environment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. No, thanks. And I now call on Alex Johnson. Five minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Would that be a whole five minutes? 
The, uh, I begin by offering the apologies of Cameron Buchanan, who has been involved in the process uh, of this bill uh, on committee. Uh, sadly, uh, Cameron has been called away on personal business today, uh, and as a result, he has asked me to step in at the last minute. Uh, I was handed the papers and told it was uncontroversial. That has happened before, and I have seen that as a challenge. But on this occasion, let me assure David Stewart, uh, the, whose bill this is, uh, that I will not be trying to stir up unnecessary con uh, con controversy. In fact, I begin by paying tribute to David Stewart because the process of putting a member's bill through Parliament uh, is a complex and difficult one and it requires a great deal of effort on the part of the bill's sponsor. So I think we should uh, first of all congratulate David Stewart for his achievement. It's something I've never actually done myself. I've never taken one to completion. I do remember at one point uh, bringing forward a proposal for a bill many years ago now that would have had the effect of requiring country of origin labelling for meat. Uh, I had several meetings on the subject and uh, met with Jim Walker, the then president of the NFU in Scotland, who uh, on a, a quiet, at a quiet moment during the meter, meeting whispered to me, yes, country of origin labelling, that would be a good idea, but to be honest, species of origin labelling would be just as useful. Uh, a precursor perhaps to a story that hit the news some ten years later, uh, and one which should uh, encourage us to take a long-term view in a number of subjects. Yet, the nature of this legislation is something which we should uh, be concerned about. It is one of these uncontentious pieces of legislation ideally suited uh, to a member's bill and one which will, I believe, have a significant impact in many areas of Scotland. The quality of the built environment is something we should always be concerned about. And of course, safety is an issue when we have buildings and some of our town centres in a, a state where bits can drop off and do damage to people as they pass on the street. Uh, we've already heard Sarah Boyack talk at some length about her experience in Edinburgh itself. Uh, what springs to mind for me uh, is many of our county and market towns across Scotland, which were once prosperous but are now somewhat less so. And as a consequence, buildings can quite often fall into disrepair. And as a result uh, of the difficulties of bringing owners together in order to achieve the objective of repair, it is important that local government does have the powers of last resort in order to achieve what we want to achieve. This bill delivers the powers and it delivers the process. It, it delivers the opportunity for local government to ensure that these criteria are filled. And as such, I think it is a sound example of what this parliament can achieve. Looking at the, the general issues uh, surrounding the process that we have gone through, uh, this has been uncontroversial. Uh, we have seen nobody contest any of the amendments. And yet, at the same time, we have seen uh, the mover of a bill and the government minister and his department work together seamlessly in order to bring legislation to fruition in this parliament for the benefit of all. I think there are some days when this parliament does not distinguish itself. There are other days when, in a very unspectacular way, it does. I think this is one of them. Thanks so much. And we now move to the open debate. And I call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Alex Rowley. Um, four minutes earlier by Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I, too, uh, would like to start off by uh, paying tribute to, to Mr Stewart uh, and his four-year struggle uh, to get this bill to where it is today. Um, and others have already talked uh, about the cooperation that there has been between Mr Stewart, the government, committees and others. And I think uh, one of the reasons why this has been so su successful is the fact that uh, Mr Stewart entered this with a spirit of cooperation, uh, a great degree of gumption uh, and a hell of a lot of civility, it has to be said. And I think that that is the way to push things uh, forward. We have heard uh, already today um, about the four million pounds or thereby of outstanding debt. But throughout the country, um, there are buildings which are in a state of disrepair, uh, which councils have to chase up uh, owners on a regular basis, often fail to do so. And as has been pointed out earlier on in the debate, owners maybe 
anywhere in the world and very difficult to contact. Uh, somebody spoke about Antigua earlier. I had a, a case myself a number of years ago as a councillor uh, where the owner uh, was in Gibraltar um, and almost uh, impossible uh, to get that person uh, to, to, to cooperate with the council. We all know uh, of blights uh, in communities right across the country. Uh, and I hope that this bill, as well as allowing for the recovery of these costs for councils, will also uh, persuade these owners who allow uh, their properties to become derelict uh, and unsightly to actually get on with the job and fix them without councils having to step in to do so. I think that this bill, as well as actually dealing with a difficulty, might actually be a prevention uh, and will stop some of the unscrupulous uh, property owners uh, from allowing buildings uh, to go to rack and ruin. And often these buildings uh, have uh, major historical uh, and uh, significance uh, are uh, a part of our heritage uh, and unfortunately uh, they are left to rot. Probably the best example in my own constituency at this moment in time is Broadford Works uh, where there is planning permission to do a number of things. However, uh, what we have seen uh, is time and time again acts of fire raising which has led to uh, situations where those buildings are becoming more and more dangerous and, uh, of course, uh, steps have to be taken to deal with that. And there's probably not one of us uh, in this chamber that could not name uh, buildings in their own patches uh, which are suffering similar fates. So while I think uh, that this bill is extremely worthy in terms of, uh, of recovery of costs, I do hope uh, that what we will also see um, is that prevention. Uh, we have had uh, uh, some very good uh, information from those folks who have submitted evidence during the course of this. Um, Mr Stewart, I know, has thought long and hard about uh, what others have said and has uh, amended accordingly and agreed to amend amendments. Uh, and I would just like to finish off uh, by uh, reiterating uh, that we can do things well, as Mr Johnson says, if we enter into things with that spirit of cooperation, that gumption uh, and that civility. And I would pay tribute to, to Mr Stewart for approaching this bill in that manner. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Rowley to be followed by Roderick Campbell. I thank you, President Officer. I, I would also begin by congratulating David Stewart for, for bringing this, this bill uh, through the different stages and getting it here today. Um, I would also pay tribute to, to the Minister, Derek Mackay, um, for his approach to this bill and the Scottish Government for taking it on board. Hopefully, it's a sign of the way that we actually can work together for the better interests of our communities and for Scotland. And hopefully, we'll, you know, once we get past this, um, this, this, this landmark date in September, regardless of the outcome, hopefully we can start to see parties across this chamber working much more closely together for communities and for Scotland. I also pay tribute to the chairman of the, the local government um, committee, Kevin Stewart, um, for the way that, that the local government committee have um, been able to also engage with the minister and with David Stewart in terms of moving this, this bill forward. I always ask myself in these, these situations, what does it mean for, for, for my constituents? And, and, and as, as Kevin Stewart has said, we can all talk about buildings. I did when, when this um, bill first came to the local government um, committee. I talked about a building in Cowden Beath and the high street in Cowden Beath, the former Crown Hotel, uh, that sits in a terrible state of dereliction. If we look at the, the um, paper, the memorandum by the Scottish Government to the local government committee, Local Government Regeneration Committee, when it talked about defective buildings. Um, and what it said is that, that it is hoped that successful use of the new powers in the early years would give local authorities confidence to be more proactive in dealing with defective buildings in the longer term. This may take some time and will need investment by local authorities uh, from the start. And the key, the key point that I think is that hopefully it will 
uh, mean that local authorities can be more proactive. Um, because in the case of the Crown Hotel, for example, on Cowanbeath High Street, Cowanbeath is, is, is the largest high street and shopping area within my constituency, and this, this building sits uh, and blights the high street sitting on the end of it. Um, and despite continued pressure for local councillors and for others, um, the council seem to think that they've been powerless to act. And I did meet with the council recently and asked them as a result of this bill how they felt they would be able to use the legislation to, to try and, and, and move things forward. And I wrote to them again last week and they have said that, that, that they will continue to put pressure on. But I actually believe that, that this bill will help put pressure on the council to put pressure on the owners of the building and crucially see that dereliction um, pulled down at a time when the economy is starting to move, at a time when, when local town centres are starting to see some improvement and at a time when local authorities are putting more resources in. I think it's important that we do use this bill to be able to try and force owners to either take action or if they fail to take action to um, take that action on their behalf and be able to, to address it. And that's why I'm pleased in terms of the definition of a defective building, because I know it's here in, in a spice briefing that a defective building notice specifies particular defects in a building that must be rectified to bring it up to a reasonable state of repair for its age, type and location. And I would say that a building sitting on the, the, the edge of a major high street that has no roof on it, that has bits of it that's caved in, even though it may not be a danger to the public, uh, actually an obsolete building such as that is, is a blight on the community and something that, that needs to be tackled. I do hope that this bill will help us in Cowan Beath, but I also hope that it will help communities right across Scotland. And once again, congratulations to Mr Stewart for sticking in there and bringing it forward. Many thanks. I now call on Roderick Campbell, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Thank you, uh, Mr Campbell, Campbell four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate David Stewart on having brought this member's bill this far. I'm not a member of the Local Government Committee, but I have read David Stewart's bill with interest, and I know he's a man of many talents, as displayed earlier this afternoon, and watched uh, with interest last night as his convenership of uh, the uh, cross-party group on diabetes. But uh, a busy man. It's fair to say, from the architectural point of view, Scotland's a lot of history. Edinburgh, our capital, is an architect's dream with medieval buildings standing side by side Mr. with Campbell, Victorian terraces. Mr Campbell, would you like terraces. to pull the microphone towards you a little, please, to allow us all to hear you? Thank you. Uh, with Victorian terraces, Georgian townhouses and modern homes, offices and retail outlets made from glass and steel. But buildings are made from perishable materials, and they begin to crumble over time. As David Stewart's original consultation paper pointed out, we are sometimes reminded of that in the most tragic of circumstances. The case of the Australian student Christine Foster, who was working in Edinburgh's West End in the year 2000 when she was killed by falling masonry, is a sad reminder that buildings in a poor state of repair can be fatal. The fatal accident inquiry which followed that incident asked the City of Edinburgh Council to carry out an immediate audit of those buildings within the city that thought to constitute a risk to public safety. Next Saturday will be 14 years exactly since Christine Foster was killed. We owe it to the many that have been killed or suffered injury as a result of defective and dangerous buildings to ensure that our legislation designed to prevent these incidents is both robust and effective. And hopefully this bill will play a part in making legislation effective. The Buildings Scotland 2003 Act gave local authorities power to repair dangerous buildings under Section 29 and 30 and defective buildings under Section 28. As we know, if a building is considered dangerous to its occupants, a council must require the occupants to leave the building and can subsequently carry out any work it deems necessary to make the building safe, or alternatively serve a dangerous building notice on the owner if it does not intend to carry out the repairs itself. Likewise, a council can issue a defective building notice requiring the owner of a defective building, which is defined as a building which requires repair, to prevent significant deterioration of its fabric to make repairs within a defined timescale. But it's of course the case that we are currently living in an age of huge financial constraint, or not austerity, and councils cannot possibly carry out a significant volume of building repairs without recouping the outlays they incur in that process.
David Stewart has rightly pointed out that the 2003 Act in this regard has not been effective. Charging order provisions under the previous 1959 Act were not carried forward, such that the enforcement regime did not work as well as it might have done, with councils failing, facing significant monetary losses in unrecovered debts. Um, I've just followed Alec Rowley. I note that five council, in their comments on the financial memorandum, noted that there were problems with the lack of proactive action taken on defective buildings and a large repairs bill backlog to contend with. So there are challenges, nevertheless. And it's true that perhaps the biggest barrier to councils exercising their powers to repair dangerous buildings are the legal difficulties they face when it comes to recovering debts. I'm pleased that the charging order provisions in Section 1 will mark a significant improvement on the existing situation. Undoubtedly, they will give more flexibility to the council and to a building owner with the aim of ensuring that the debt is repaid. It's fair to point out that there was, of course, criticism of the initial 30-year repayment period and term of the charging order, and I'm pleased that some flexibility was given to local authorities at Stage 2. But it must be the case that a gradual recovery over several years is far better than no repayment at all. I'm also pleased by the amendments at Stage 2 and today at Stage 3, the effect of which will be to encourage local authorities to register charges promptly. And, of course, it must not be forgotten that arrangements can be made to allow charging orders to be discharged earlier. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to support this bill at Stage 3 and welcome its progress into legislation. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Alex Johnston. Four minutes or thereby, please, Mr Johnston. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has, of course, been a constructive debate, uh, and it's a constructive debate about an important, uh, though small, piece of legislation. I think one of the best speeches that we've heard in the debate was the one that we've just had from Roderick Campbell. Uh, his expertise in legal circles uh, was brought to bear, I think, in explaining exactly what the consequences of failing uh, to deal with this problem might be. He, of course, reminded us that there are a number of examples, sadly, of people who have been killed or injured uh, by falling masonry or roofing tiles. And when that is possible uh, in our streets, uh, it is an example of something that we should be dealing with here. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to pay tribute, because I neglected to do so in the, the, my earlier speech, to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, I mentioned that uh, it is an onerous task to take through a piece of members' legislation. It is uh, for the, the individual member. It is, of course, also the case for the committee that takes that, that responsibility. Uh, and I'm glad that the committee and its convener were able to deal with this uh, in such an effective manner. Uh, it's been an interesting debate for me for one other reason, and perhaps I'm getting the technicalities wrong here, but I would like to make my mark by noting that in this debate, I believe I heard Angela Constance speak on behalf of the Queen. So with that said, I think there is little more than I can say other to congratulate all those who have been involved in this bill and to say that when decision time comes tonight, uh, that the Conservatives will confidently support the Buildings Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill. And I wish uh, David Stewart good luck in achieving his objective. Many thanks. And I now call on Anne McTaggart, a generous four minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm keen to contribute and close today's Stage 3 debate for the Scottish Labour Party on the defective and dangerous buildings recovery expenses Scotland Bill. And thank David Stewart for all his hard work in bringing forward these important proposals to the Parliament. And also a huge thank to our convener and members of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, of which I am one. In response to the Minister Derek Mackay, I am pleased to note that the Scottish Government continues to broadly support this bill and I welcome his amendments. I agree that the majority of these amendments are procedural and serve to strengthen our shared aims. Ultimately, the proposed bill provides the power for local authorities to carry out modifications on defective or dangerous buildings and pass this cost on to the owner of that building. And in response, um, Sarah Boyack has rightly raised um, the concern that local authorities are paying for repairs to derelict properties in times of budget constraints, which is both unfair and un unsustainable. 
Um, this piece of legislation will help to address this issue and it is a common sense answer to the question to improve our town and city centres. I welcome the reintroduction of charging orders as a means of ensuring that the local authority is able to recover its expenses before the building changes ownership. To clarify, when owners fail to respond to the local authorities' notice, some of which um, have been mentioned to be in Antigua, I think that was Sarah Boyack, and um, my colleague um, Kevin Stewart mentioned one who was in dealing with a case who the owner was in Gibraltar. Their, their residence is unsafe and must be altered. This Act will facilitate repayment for the authorities who undertake these modifications. David Stewart's Members' Bill amends the Building Act of 2003 in order to introduce a more efficient and flexible cost recovery process for local authorities. It grants local authorities the power to make charging orders which will attach to the properties in question and recover some of the outstanding debt when the property is eventually sold. It creates flexibility in allowing property owners to negotiate with the local authority and possibly pay a reduced amount, which improves debt recovery rates while also allowing for a settlement acceptable to both parties. I believe this bill will significantly increase recovery rates of expenses from building owners, given that the, the current recovery rate is low at only 50%. By expanding cost recovery mechanisms, the bill encourages the local authorities to preventatively fix defective buildings before the likely costs would increase. Currently, there is a large disparity in how local authorities are issuing notices and certain councils issue a high number of notices each year, while others issue very few or none. Additionally, notices are issued per owner, not per building. So the number of notices issued per year does not necessarily account for the true number of buildings failing under the bill's jurisdiction. This introduction of this bill will standardise the process. Presiding officer, finally, the bill creates a provision for individuals to make appeals against incorrect charging orders, thereby establishing a mechanism of accountability for local authorities carrying out these repairs. I am reassured to note that the right to appeal against a charging order has remained an important part of this bill. And I believe that its incorporation will serve to strengthen the process of recovering expenses from the building owners. I have considered the contribution of, of most of the members who spoke um, this afternoon, and apologies for the ones that I haven't. Um, and thank you for sharing your fine examples of how this bill will ultimately benefit our, com our communities. And I am confident that there exists a broad level of consensus for the aims of this bill. I believe that local authorities will find a way to exercise these new powers in a manner which reflects local priorities and improves the safety and aesthetics of our communities. I look forward to voting in favour of this bill. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Derek Mackay. Uh, six minutes or thereby, Minister, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. And I think this has been a, a good debate in taking forward the bill to its uh, satisfactory uh, conclusion. And again, commend Mr. Stewart, Dave Stewart, for taking forward the bill in the way that he has. I believe his stock is now even higher uh, in this Parliament across uh, the chamber, and has helped to to make the connections to make it possible for government to support the bill in such a, a constructive way. But if I can let some members into some of the uh, background and how we reached this consensual uh, position. Although the bill is worthy and the contents within it are wor worthy and there's great support and consensus and the timing was better, the community empowerment bill is more comprehensive, therefore will take a bit more time to go through Parliament and local authorities liked both sets of powers. One man's notice of liability is another man's charging order, but we've gone with a charging order. Despite all of that, Actually, the way business has been conducted is what ensured we could work on a cross-party basis. And, of course, timing is everything 
and politics as well. Uh, some members may not be aware that Mr Stewart approached me straight after the budget process this year where the Labour Party and the SNP voted together with others for the satisfactory approval of this year's budget. And that moment and spirit of cross-party consensus, he seized the moment to ensure that his bill was supported by the government as well. So there's the inside track uh, on the moment at which uh, I surrendered and gave in uh, to Mr Stewart for all the very positive reasons uh, that we've discussed, because for all this place and this parliament can be tribal, there is absolutely a time to set aside our party political differences. And it does not matter in whose name the bill is put, as long as the right bill um, is, is, is built and can deliver for the people of Scotland. And I believe that this will. Uh, Alec Johnson gave very supportive comments in terms of the Conservatives. And Kevin Stewart's absolutely right to touch on the power of prevention on this agenda. And I think it will assist local authorities in that respect with their building control a function and Alec Rowley, I think another bridge builder in this parliament in terms of what we can do when we work together about being pragmatic um, and using the powers that we have. But uh, Mr Rowley is absolutely correct. There are existing powers that local authorities could use on defective and dangerous and neglected buildings as well. But this will give them the reassurance that they will be able to have recompense for taking the necessary action when it comes to dangerous in defective buildings. But Alec Rowley poses a, an even more interesting point. Is this a sign of the future post-referendum of the Labour Party and the SNP working together the brave new world of Scottish politics? Who knows what sort of coalition might come in the future? Suddenly, the stock of some Labour members isn't quite so high, uh, I have to say, but the consensual approach is one that we would uh, like to, to continue Proactivity from the public sector, even where there's private ownership, is very much required. And I'd also cite the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill for being able to tackle neglected and abandoned land and buildings as well, because we propose quite radical legislation there too, in terms of giving communities the right to take over land and properties that have been abandoned and neglected. Yes, and using compulsion eh, too, along the lines that maybe Mr Rowley it would support. So I look forward to that legislation making its way through Parliament as well. And Roger Campbell is absolutely uh, right in terms of costs to councils. They will be more proactive if they have that certainty uh, that will be able to have their costs recompensed. And not just the cost of the work itself, uh, but the costs of administration and any necessary interest charges as well. So that the public sector takes action, the public sector is not just paying the price for private uh, neglect. Because this is first and foremost about safety, public safety, individual safety. And we do believe that the powers in the bill, with all the necessary amendments, will help deal with immediately dangerous situations, will allow the interventions that are required, will indeed stop buildings uh, deteriorating and rectify building work that doesn't meet building regulations. All very necessary which does ask the question why some of these powers were removed in 2003, something to which I have had no satisfactory uh, explanation. That's not a partisan point, but something that we'll remedy in a constructive way uh, today, hopefully when the bill um, it, it is passed, giving councils that mechanism to take right and correct and, and timely action with the confidence uh, that they will be supported. And I think that can empower communities as well, raising that culture of expectation of public sector intervention when it's and where it's required. Because we know that the current normal civil debt recovery methods were problematic and had to be uh, improved. And attaching that notice, that charging order to the titles is exactly the right thing to do. Because we know that this will be both preventative and clear up through the nature of conveyancing uh, the responsibility of owners not to have that liability hanging round their neck for any future uh, owner, unless that happens to be by agreement. So there's enough appeal mechanism, flexibility uh, and financial mechanisms to ensure that the uh, mechanisms are appropriate, it's proportionate, it's pragmatic, but it's absolutely the right thing to do to ensure that our local authorities, and working in partnership with them, are empowered to take the right interventions to keep the people of Scotland safe. And I'm happy once again to give the government's support to the dangerous and defective buildings Scotland Bill. Thanks.
And finally, I call on David Stewart to wind up the debate. Mr Stewart, eight minutes or thereby. Uh, thank you uh, very much, President Officer. And could I firstly thank each and every member that has spoken in this debate. It's probably the first time I've ever said these words in Parliament over the last seven years. But I am very, very grateful for not just the personal support to be given uh, to me, but the support that has been acknowledged for the Minister for uh, Local Government Regeneration, Delegate Powers Committee, um, and for every single member that's provided advice and support. And again, I would just like to flag up the very helpful help I've had from the Non-Government Bills Unit and the legal team and everyone else. Without that support, and like Westminster, it would be impossible, in my view, to uh, achieve a successful member's bill. I suppose, President Officer, if we needed one reason for this bill today, we only had to look back last week to Glasgow, where masonry from a sandstone building collapsed into the street to bring the bill we are considering today into a sharp focus. And one of the main drivers of the bill is to provide, of course, local authorities with greater assurances that they will recover their dangerous building costs. And with that, I hope councils will have more confidence to tackle what I would call high-level defective or borderline dangerous buildings at an earlier point, which of course will be less costly and will preserve the value and the structure of the property rather than dealing with buildings in a more dangerous state in the longer term. And I make no apologies for referring to the statistics again, which show that action without notice under Section 29 of the 2003 Act, the most urgent emergent action has more than doubled from 402 in 2010-11 to 992 in 11-12. So this clearly demonstrates the need for local authorities to have effective cost recovery tools at their disposal. And, President Officer, it's not been altogether straightforward steering the bill through Parliament. Ordinarily, of course, financial issues would cause some concern for members' bills. But this is a bill which achieves a lot for very little. You could describe it as one which punches above its weight. On this occasion, it was more the technical vagaries which made the process more difficult. Although I had developed it based on existing relevant statutory frameworks, local authorities' approach to debt recovery can vary. However, as a result of the parliamentary process and with the support of the Scottish Government, the Bill does more than just recreate what has gone before in the 1959 Act. It creates a modern version of a charging order which can be used by local authorities in their building compliance, enforcement and public safety work under the 2003 Act. I think members made excellent contributions and very informed knowledge about uh, the Bill. Uh, Derek Mackay, I really appreciate his positive comments. Sir uh, Boyk, particularly with her background in planning and her particular knowledge of uh, Edinburgh and Lothian, had a, a very strong knowledge of the quality of the built environment and the practical provisions of the bill. I would particularly emphasise that it's not just about local authorities. Charging orders are a great benefit to low-income owners, perhaps who are retired or staying in larger houses when their family have left. This can be a very beneficial approach. And of course, we all know that the debt running around four million is a horrendous sum across Scotland. Um, I was bemused um, by my colleague Alec Johnston, if he uh, pays attention, um, being referred to the fact that um, Mr Johnston, I was bemused by his description um, of being uncontroversial, and I wonder if that was the same Alec Johnston that he knew. Uh, but nevertheless, he did end with a very positive point about bringing Parliament together, and I think there is a, a wider philosophical point which I would share his view. And I think Kevin Stewart also made a very statesmanlike comment about that very same point as well, about the spirit of cooperation, spirit of cooperation we can do more uh, together. Uh, again, uh, Alec Riley has got great knowledge, obviously, of the local government with his experience in Fife, and he has some really good examples in Fife, uh, and I praise the work that he's done, not just now, but in his role as a very prominent councillor for many years. Uh, Roderick Campbell, of course, um, is a very knowledgeable um, uh, advocate, and is, I know he's got tremendous understanding of this issue. He did raise the very tragic case of Christine Foster, and I acknowledge uh, the points that he made um, on that particular point. And again, I would like to thank the comments made by Amit Tagger about trying to standardise across um, Scotland. Very, very important that, that, that um, we do that in the longer term. And very briefly, uh, President Officer, I just finished by just uh, doing a quick run-through what I see as the advantages of charging orders, which I think um, are crucially important. So basically, I see them as adding to the local authority cost recovery toolkit to deal with both large and small repayable amounts, securing the debt over the property, which creates a priority for the debt, which would not allow us to have had as an ordinary and secured debt, including provision for recovery of expenses incurred over and above the basic costs of undertaking the work, perhaps a point that's not been raised. So, for example, local authority administrative costs, registering and discharge fees and interest 
are all things that can be added to the charging order. And as the order is against the property, it avoids the need to pursue an individual in the civil courts, which, as members will know, is not always successful and can be very expensive. So this can be both time-consuming and costly, and depending on the sums involved, when their owner is traceable, may not be a viable option, whether in a TIA or elsewhere. It also provides a greater guarantee of the costs being recovered. It enables a local authority to determine the number of annual instalments, taking into account Sarah Boyk's point of the ability of the person to pay. And it will act as an incentive to make those liable pay rather than incur the additional costs. Also, the normal requirement to clear the charging order prior to the sale or transfer of the property will give an incentive for property owners to make payment of the outstanding sums to facilitate a sale. So the introduction of several liability means that an owner cannot avoid their responsibilities. So I also believe that it's likely to be better to have had the repairs carried out and the charging order placed than for the property to fall into further disrepair, which is not just a problem for the owner, but of course the owner's neighbours and the value of property in that street as well. So charging orders have an advantage in that their assistance and some charge are easy to establish from the run land register at point of sale. So in conclusion, President Officer, I would like to say that the bill is the first for this Parliament session because I believe it's the first opposition member's bill to reach this stage in the parliamentary process. And a fair wind at decision time will see this become a first for me as well, having attempted a few occasions, both as an MP in at Westminster and MSP here, to promote a member's bill. So with great pleasure, I commend the Building Recovery of Expensive Scotland Bill to Parliament. Well done. And that concludes the debate on the Building Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10371 in the name of Fiona Hislop on stage one of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And if you are ready, Cabinet Secretary, I would call on you, Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, to speak to and move the motion, please, 10 minutes or thereby. Uh, Presiding Officer, I want to start by welcoming the Committee's report, which raised a number of areas uh, where clarification of our intentions is important. I agree with the Committee on the need for clear and shared understanding, and will refer this afternoon to the key topics considered by the Committee, and I will write to the Committee before recess to respond uh, on an item-by-item -item basis to their thorough and encouraging report. We last debated Scotland's historic environment in September. Uh, that debate reminded us that heritage takes many forms, uh, from our stunning castles, abbeys and prehistoric sites, to the living heritage of song, poetry and traditions. I recently visited uh, Urquhart Castle on Loch Ness to see one of Scotland's premier monuments. We have witnessed the response to the fire at Glasgow School of Art, admired uh, the resilience of those directly affected and been stunned by the flood of offers of help from across the world. And what strikes me is that although we talk about the historic environment, it's really as much about people as buildings. Historic environment is about what people want to pass on to their children and grandchildren. It's about where we come from, where we are today and where we are all going. Scotland's historic environment is a, a vital resource in cultural, social and economic terms. It can and should deliver greater benefits for communities. I believe we all agree on that. And as the committee recognised in their report, the Historic Environment Scotland Bill is only part of a wider strategy. And I will say more about the strategy in a few moments. The bill's central purpose is to create a single modern body with clearly defined functions. It is designed to sustain the strong base we already possess and to prepare for the future. In that ambition, the bill is not revolutionary, although I was gratified to hear it referred to by a delegate at a recent conference as, I quote, a triumph and long overdue. It surprised me uh, when I took my, on my present portfolio to learn that while the Royal Commission has a royal warrant setting out its terms of reference, an organisation as distinctive as Historic Scotland currently has no statutory existence. Although it does perform statutory functions, it does so as a, an administrative aspect of ministers. We don't believe that is right, and we intend to create an NDPB with its own board to provide strong and transparent governance. We firmly believe that the role of ministers is to steer activities at a strategic level and not interfere in the details of particular cases where professional expertise should be the guide. As I have said, the bill sets explicit functions for the new body, and the committee has considered those functions carefully. 
Beyond that, the Bill sets out how those functions will be carried out. It will require the Historic Environment Scotland to offer leadership and support uh, partnership working so that knowledge, skills and resources are mobilised to best effect across the whole sector. HES will be expected to help things happen just as much as it does things at its own hand. The Bill aligns designation and consents for monuments, listed buildings and conservation areas more closely with modern planning practice. It repositions Historic Environment Scotland largely as a consultation body alongside SNH and SEPA to create a simpler system for all who are involved with the vital business of developing Scotland's full potential. And these changes have been welcomed by local authorities who are working with us on the details. To balance the greater freedom the new body will have, the Bill creates new rights of appeal. The committee has commented on the arrangements in the bill for delegating the operation and management of the 345 properties in state care through ownership or guardian agreements, uh, guardianship agreements to Historic Environment Scotland. And we share the committee's assessment of just how significant those iconic properties are. And that is why ministers have decided to retain the ultimate responsibility for the conservation and for public access. The committee has co commented on the possibility of his, uh, seeking charitable status. That will, as I've already stated on more than one occasion, be something I wish the new board to decide for themselves. But I can say now that I will work very closely with the incoming chair to emphasise how vital it is for Historic Environment Scotland to support other bodies already working in the sector. That will apply whether or not HES seeks or achieves charitable status. William MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking uh, an intervention and for the comments she's made in relation to an issue that was raised with the committee. She may have seen the, the Law Society have raised some concerns about a charitable body carrying out statutory functions, and I wonder if there's any observations she could offer to the Chamber on that point. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member was a, a member of the committee when the National Libraries of Scotland, which has charitable functions, we've got the National Collections, which are charities, but are NDPB. So there's a number of, of uh, similar areas where it does actually um, occur uh, currently. Um, I'm expecting the new body created by the Bill to lead the sector in delivering shared goals, uh, but to do so in supportive manner and in partnership. Um, I also intend to start work, work on recruiting that, the board of uh, HES as soon as Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Bill. Those shared goals um, in terms of what we expect uh, from, the, from the new body with uh, its different partners in the sector will be founded on the strategy, Our Place in Time, which sets, sets out a clear vision for the historic environment to ensure it is even better understood, protected and celebrated. I welcome the committee's strong interest in the collective works undertaken by the sector to develop a strategic vision and framework for the sector. And this, of course, the starting point of a long-term process, uh, which will be very much a partnership. And I've been heartened by the engagement of the wider sector in the creation of the strategy, and I'm very much looking forward to chairing the first meeting of its overarching forum this Monday. I recently wrote to the convener of the committee setting out membership of the forum. The strategy will interact with many other initiatives, such as the Community Empowerment Bill, which was introduced into Parliament on the 11th of June. And the gov government firmly believes in communities and in collaborative action, and we will take on board the committee's message that the local dimension will be key both to the operations of HES and to its ability to support local communities in making decisions which contribute to national outcomes. And we're asking the whole historic environment community to work together in this enterprise. So what is it that the Scottish Government uh, is contributing? Well, one of the issues raised in the committee was funding. And despite the economic situation, we have been able to maintain historic Scotland's budget for the grant which it makes on Minister's behalf to projects throughout Scotland uh, for historic buildings, conservation areas and archaeological investigations. And we recognise that communities have vast enthusiasm and energy but that financial resources are harder to come by. And that is why I have worked very hard to protect Historic Scotland's external grants programme for this year. And today, Presiding Officer, I can confirm that I have asked Historic Scotland to maintain its annual grant budget at approximately £14.5 million into 2015-16. And I will look to its successor to continue to support others through grants and in as many ways as possible. I'm also pleased to announce that today's grants, totalling almost £2 million, uh, including support for Glasgow Citizens Theatre's ambitions plans, which the Heritage Lottery Fund is also backing. And this will support restoration work uh, at seven historical sites across Scotland and takes the amount Historic Scotland has awarded in building repair grants to an almost £28 million over the last five years.
And this underlines our commitment to protecting and preserving Scotland's built heritage for future generations and to ensuring that the historic environment continues to play an important role supporting local communities and the Scottish economy. And, Presiding Officer, I also want to take this opportunity to commend the skills and passion of the staff of Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. I am unfailingly impressed by the professionalism they bring to the unending task of caring for our heritage and by the variety of approaches they bring to bear. And this government will support staff with their work as we go into the future, as they in turn work alongside our local authorities, uh, conservation charities and many thousands of private owners, all of whom make invaluable contributions to the historic environment. So in conclusion, I'd like to reiterate uh, why we believe this bill deserves the support of Parliament. It brings together two successful bodies to create a single modern body better equipped to meet future challenges. It sets out in one place for the very first time the key historic environment functions which this government believes should be supported. It sets out principles of partnership working and transparency within a broader strategic framework. It simplifies essential processes so that we can concentrate on getting the best for and from our historic environment. It reaffirms this government's commitment to a historic environment which is at the heart of a flourishing and sustainable Scotland. And for these reasons, uh, I ask for your support and move the motion that Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Stuart Maxwell, who is opening on behalf of the Education and Culture Committee. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, speaking today as I am as Committee Convener, I'd like to begin by thanking all those who provided the Education and Culture Committee with written and oral evidence on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. We very much appreciated the detailed submissions that we received. I'd also like to thank all those who took the time to come along to talk to us during our visit to Orkney. And finally, I'd like to thank my committee colleagues and the committee clerks and SPICE for all of their hard work and support during the Stage 1 process. Presiding Officer, the Historic Environment Scotland Bill is one of those bills that appears to be relatively straightforward. The legislation will, in effect, create a, body, a new body to continue the functions of its predecessors, namely Historic Scotland and RCAMS. Of course, stage one scrutiny is never that simple, and we addressed in our report a number of questions or concerns that were raised in evidence. We also looked at ways of improving the bill and the wider strategy referred to by the Cabinet Secretary. Now, I'll address some of these points in a minute, but I wish to highlight at the outset that we welcome the intended benefits of the merger and unanimously endorse the Bill's general principles. I also want to highlight that our report laid down something of a challenge to other members who would be taking part in this debate. This challenge stems from the very frank but welcome admission that some parts of Scotland are punching below their weight in realising the full benefits of the historic environment. Other parts, of course, of the country are, of course, doing very well. But given this comment during evidence taking, we want other MSPs to consider how they can best help to promote Scotland's historic environment to make sure its value is fully realised. If, as parliamentarians, we endorse a bill and a strategy that advocates improvement, partnership working and better leadership, it may strengthen our position if we demonstrate these qualities ourselves. In considering the bill's merits, the committee was fortunate enough to visit an area of the country that is crammed full of architectural and, and cultural treasures. A sun-filled day in Orkney in May, and Liam MacArthur assures me that it's always like that, it is notable for many reasons, but not least because of the beauty of a landscape that can indeed leave a profound impression on anyone who visits. It is such impressions that help to confirm the value of our heritage in the broadest sense, not just in terms of increasing commercial ex exploitation or tourism numbers, but in connecting us to our shared history, our landscape and our cultural heritage. It is a source of some pride that we could have visited virtually any other region of Scotland and been treated to a different but similar display of historical and cultural rich richness. One of the findings we took from Orkney and one of the recurring themes of our report was the need for better communication about some of the Bill's provisions. For example, there was some concern in the sector about the extent of the new body's remit. Whilst Historic, Scot whilst historic Environment Scotland is to investigate, care for and protect the historic environment, we questioned whether this meant all of the historic environment. We noted, for example, that the vast majority of historic buildings are indeed under private ownership and responsibility. The Cabinet Secretary confirmed the new organisation will be better placed to provide leadership and work collaboratively with the sector, but it will not have direct responsibility for the historic environment that some stakeholders perhaps thought it would have. 
And to avoid any doubt about Historic Environment Scotland's role, we have called on the Scottish Government to explain this as clearly as possible to all of the relevant bodies working in the sector. We made a very similar recommendation about the need to establish a shared understanding of what the term historic environment encompasses. One of our main discussions in taking evidence was whether the Bill itself should define historic environment whilst recognising that there is a full definition contained in the strategy. On balance, we were persuaded by the Cabinet Secretary's arguments that the Bill need not define the term. However, the crucial factor here is that we must avoid any possible confusion about the division of responsibilities between Historic Environment Scotland and other relevant bodies. As there appears to be a general agreement that the definition in the strategy is sufficiently clear, we have called on the Scottish Government to ensure that all parties have a shared understanding of this definition as the Bill and the strategy are implemented. Presenting officer, I want to mention three further areas where we have called on the Scottish Government to provide clarification to stakeholders to make sure their concerns are addressed. First, we want the Cabinet Secretary to confirm who would be responsible for paying for the repair and maintenance bill for the properties in care, the 345 properties managed by Ministers for the Nation. There appears to be some uncertainty in some quarters around this point. Second, some organisations express concern to us that the new body may be at risk of a conflict of interests. This concern was linked in part to the suggestion that Historic Environment Scotland could be increasingly focused on raising income and therefore less focused on undertaking its regulatory functions. Other committee members, I'm sure, will no doubt mention these issues in their own contributions. However, I want to point out that while we were unconvinced about new conflicts of interest emerging, we did recognise that organisations had some legitimate concerns. We have therefore called on the Cabinet Secretary to continue speaking to these groups that have made positive suggestions as to how their concerns could be addressed. We noted in doing so, presenting officer, the successful implementation of this bill and the strategy will largely depend on effective partnership working and the goodwill of all parties involved. There is one, one other area where we call for further clarification from the Scottish Government. In essence, we want to be clear about the relationship between the board set up to drive the historic environment strategy and the separate Historic Environment Scotland Board. Again, other members will no doubt discuss this issue, but we particularly want to understand how the two board boards will work together should problems arise in implementing the strategy. Presiding officer, I wish to conclude by reiterating another theme from our report, namely ensuring progress is actually made and all, that all parts of Scotland can punch above their weight. Now, I began by suggesting that all members have a role to play in helping to promote our shared historic environment. We also have an interest in making sure that the anticipated benefits of the bill and strategy are actually delivered. The Education and Culture Committee intends to play its part in this and therefore it would be our intention at a future date to assess the progress made once the new organisation is established and the strategy has been implemented. And we make that recommendation at paragraph 19 of our report. We have also made a related but more specific recommendation to the Scottish Government at paragraph 20. Historic Environment Scotland is to regularly publish a corporate plan, setting out the outcomes to be delivered. We consider these annual reports should not just be forward-looking. They should also say which previous objectives have or have not been achieved. We consider this will help to make such reports more balanced and give a clearer picture of where success has or has not been delivered. That presiding officer is something I am sure that all members would find extremely useful. Presiding officer, in the time available, I have not been able to mention or discuss in depth all the main points raised in the report. However, I know that other committee members will wish to raise issues such as how Historic Environment Scotland can exercise its functions in a way that takes due account of local issues and local decision-making processes. Also, the exact role Historic Environment Scotland will play in relation to the marine environment and, of course, the possible impact of the new body being granted charitable status. Presiding officer, in closing, can I once again thank all those who engaged with the committee during our stage one examination of the bill and say that while there are, there are details that require attention and discussion as we go forward with this bill, the committee are unanimous in backing the principles of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call in Patricia Ferguson up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And firstly, can I thank the Education and Culture Committee for their considered report which raises a number of important issues which we do well to consider today. Uh, like Mr Maxwell, I may not be able to cover all the points I'd wish to make in my opening speech, but as I have the opportunity to close too, I'll certainly plan to return to them then. But secondly, I would want to put on record my thanks to all the staff and the boards of Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland 
who have, are and will continue to work hard to ensure that the transition from two organisations to one goes as smoothly as such mergers ever can. I have had the privilege to work closely with both organisations over the years and I've been very impressed by their knowledge and expertise as well as their commitment to our historic environment. And the respect I have for both organisations has perhaps coloured my assessment of the proposal to merge them. And I have had real concerns, as I've expressed before, about its effect. However, having had discussions with the management of both organisations, I'm persuaded, perhaps not so much that the merger is the right decision, but that the people leading the two organisations will make it work. And I look forward very much to seeing their draft corporate plan when it is published. But as the committee report makes clear, we will only be able to judge at a later date whether the improvements promised are realised. Now, I very much welcome the strategy our place in time, and I recognise that it is perhaps the first strategy of its kind in Scotland, but I wouldn't want the Chamber or indeed the general public to think that we have not had concern about our historic environment over the years. And I would draw attention to the great amount of hard work put in by both organisations to documents, for example, the series of Sheps produced um, when um, Labour was in power, but also continued when the SNP took over documents that I think are very good and have certainly set the pace up until now. But to turn now to the substance of the committee's report, the, the committee noted that the bill's accompanying documents do not specify the outcomes the new body is to deliver, but note that a corporate plan will be published regularly by the new organisation. And I would agree with the committee that it is important that this document should identify the objectives achieved, but also that it should look at those that have not been reached. And I would hope that the measurement of the objectives in this way could then influence subsequent plans. And it, in its evidence to the committee, Archaeology Scotland made an important point about the functions of the new body and, how, and suggested that the bill was perhaps unclear in this area. They rightly identified that over 90% of Scotland's archaeological assets are within the remit of planning authorities at present and that the bill wasn't quite clear as to whether or not this would change. So the clarification the Cabinet Secretary provided to the committee in this regard is welcome. But I think it will be important that all stakeholders share that understanding of what the role actually will be. And I think it would also be helpful if clarification could be provided cons concerning the respective responsibilities of Historic Environment Scotland and Marine Scotland. With Historic Environment Scotland not being expected to undertake historic designations regarding marine protected areas, although being an expert advisor in that role, there is some concern in some areas that this, may, this important subject area may fall between the two organisations. And again, some additional clarity there might be helpful. Another issue that seems to have been uh, one that taxed some of those giving evidence was the need to avoid centralising decision-making, something that I think is very important in this regard. And I know that the Minister has indicated to the committee that she does not expect that centralisation would be a consequence of the change. But I wonder if the Minister, perhaps in her closing speech, could indicate how this will be guaranteed if um, not, as I would perhaps prefer, it would be stated on the face of the bill. Now, as I've already identified, the role of local authorities is particularly important when we consider our historic environment, and they have, of course, a range of responsibilities. But one um, issue that is often identified by local authorities is the difficulty they have in gaining or recruiting enough uh, staff of sufficient level of expertise to be able to assist them in their duties. And I think that very much uh, connects to the issue of skills, which is one that was raised with members, or has been raised rather with members by the Society of Antiquaries, who feel that there should be a specific reference to the need to maintain and develop skills. They argue that this is different from uh, the need to um, learn about and educate others about the historic environment and that it is a much more specific uh, uh, specification, I suppose, would be the word that they would want us to use. 
I wonder too if the Cabinet Secretary feels that perhaps a reference to skills within the bill might be helpful. Um, I realise that flexibility in a bill is something that ministers always seek and I understand perfectly why that would be, but it might just be helpful if there was a reference to that. And again, with regard to the bill itself, definition has clearly been the subject of some debate within the committee and I see that the committee have concluded that the most important point was that there is a definition in this case in the strategy and not in the bill and once again I would imagine that flexibility is key but I wonder whether this might be something that could also be reiterated in the corporate plan just to make sure that there is robust uh, underpinning of what those um, issues are actually meant to be. The issue of uh, charitable status is again one that has exercised uh, comments that have come to the committee and I think that charitable status, if it were to be obtained, would be an area where considerable difference could be made to the finances of Historic Scotland. But I wonder if the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary rather, might like to explain later on today some of the other benefits that might accrue from charitable status other than the financial ones, if Historic Scotland were to seek that. But we know that some other organisations are anxious that Historic Environment Scotland might seek funding from other sources and would, in a sense, be competing with organisations like NTS in what is already a very crowded sector. And I think that is something we would want to avoid. Uh, Presiding Officer, I know that I really need to come to a close. I have so many other things that I would like to talk about. I'll do that later. But I would just want to say before I finish, and I think it would be a miss not to, much of the function of the bill talks about the uh, things that have to be underpinned by legislation. Of course, that is what the bill is about. But of necessity, that means that much of those functions are functions normally carried out by Historic Scotland. The position of our CAMS perhaps gets much less focus in the bill as I say, for understandable reasons. And I think it would just be um, worthwhile putting on record that the work that ARCAMS has done and the elements of that work that will carry forward are just as important. Thank you very much. I now call in Liz Smith. Maximum five minutes, please. Uh, thank you. And could I apologise to the Cabinet Secretary for missing the first minute of her uh, speech? Uh, the Scottish Tories warmly welcome the publication of this Stage 1 report, and I think that's largely because uh, the logic behind the bill is fundamentally sound. By merging Historic Scotland with Arkham, Arkhams, there will be an agency that is better equipped uh, to conserving Scotland's historic environment at what is uh, a particularly challenging time as set out by the Cabinet Secretary. That is not to say that either body has in any way failed in its current duties, far from it. Uh, I think there have been warm words about the staff in both and we would echo that. Indeed, Scotland can be extremely proud of its heritage and how it has been managed but clearly there is a consensus that more of a strategic approach uh, would further strengthen our historic environment sector. Now, I know time is extremely uh, tight, Deputy Presiding Officer, so I hope you'll forgive me if I concentrate my remarks, uh, despite these very warm words, uh, which I want to be the emphasis of my speech, uh, on some issues where I think we need some uh, clarification. And the first is about the accountability for the uh, strategic direction of the new body. And I think that's borne out in the evidence with some of the witnesses uh, who also believe that there is a lack of clarity uh, when giving evidence to the uh, Education and Culture Committee on the 20th of May, the Cabinet Secretary indicated if, if the Board were to have a difference of opinion with the Scottish Government about strategic direction, perhaps unlikely, but it could happen, uh, then the latter would have the final say on what that direction uh, should be. I remain slightly concerned by the response, uh, and in particular about the possible uh, ramifications uh, that it could have for the applications uh, for charitable status. Uh, I note the text of a subsequent letter to the committee convener uh, from the Cabinet Secretary clarifying her remarks and indicating that she would not uh, direct members of the uh, new uh, bodies board. And I, I welcome that. But just to be absolutely specific, I think paragraph 88 of the policy uh, memorandum says that Scottish ministers will be able to give directions to Historic Environment Scotland about the exercise of its functions, but obviously not on specific cases, objects or properties, uh, so as to ensure operational independence. Yet 12.3 of the bill says that section 12.2a uh, does not apply 
where Scottish ministers have delegated functions in relation to properties and care and in oral evidence, uh, Scottish government ministers, uh, officials rather confirm that ministers intend to delegate the operation of all uh, 345 properties in their care to Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, so I think there are some issues there, Cabinet Secretary, that need a little bit of clarification. Perhaps they are uh, semantic, but I think uh, it's quite clear at the moment that there is a recognition that in some cases uh, HES will actually be working on behalf of Scottish ministers. Uh, as the bill continues uh, its progression, uh, I think further clarity uh, regarding the relationship between the operational board and the overarching historic environment board would also be welcome. Uh, as it stands, the consensual language of historic environment uh, strategy document, which envisage, envisages joint working and a shared vision, uh, is absolutely uh, correct. And I think we like to hear that, but it doesn't actually sit terribly easily with some of the clauses within the bill, which state that the new body must have regard to any relevant policy or strategy published by Scottish ministers. Again, I think there's some semantic details there that perhaps could be tightened up. Uh, a second uh, issue, I think, uh, as has been mentioned... Um, yes, of course. Cabinet Secretary. I much appreciate the members' points, and either in my summing up, but certainly my response to the committee will address these. But let's take, for example, the issue of energy efficiency and climate change, which is a government policy we'd expect all public bodies, bodies to be helping support that. We frequently get asked by MSPs, are we delivering on that? So that maybe is an example of where you would want to, to make sure there was a regard to uh, government policy. That's maybe a good example to use. Liz uh, Smith, I'll I, give I'm, you a few seconds back. Sorry, Presidium. Sorry, I'm saying I will give you a few seconds back. Uh, thanks, thank you. Um, I, I take that point, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I think that's very helpful. And I don't doubt that there's going to be large agreement between the overall uh, direction, but I think if we are to be uh, a little bit... Uh, uh, pedantic about it, there are issues about what would happen in circumstances where perhaps they took a slightly different view uh, from government policy and uh, who would have the ultimate responsibility and accountability for the strategy. I think that's the uh, general point. I think um, one of the uh, huge successes of Historic Scotland has been its decentralised approach and uh, it would be extremely unfortunate to say the least if the bill unpicked that. Uh, as it stands, not only are there individual agreements between Historic Scotland and certain councils, but there's also a joint working agreement which ensures uh, a degree of consistency regarding how the histor historic environment is managed. Uh, so I echo some colleagues' uh, concerns uh, about that. I think there are issues uh, which I think my colleague uh, Mary Scanlon will deal with that uh, come to uh, funding. Uh, I think there are some issues that were raised, uh, particularly when it came to the awarding of uh, grants if I remember correctly, that was the Law Society who uh, re raised these uh, concerns. But in summary, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it, it, even if there are uh, several significant areas of concern, uh, we do uh, thoroughly support the intentions behind the bill. I think there's a universal recognition that a much more strategic fo focus uh, will safeguard the long-term future of historics, uh, uh, Scotland's historic environment. And I'm sure within the process of Stage 2 and indeed uh, Stage 3, uh, we can address these concerns uh, so that we have a, a better agency. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. We don't have a lot of time in hand, so speeches of four minutes, please. Claire Adamson to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's um, been um, a pleasure to be part of the processing committee uh, as this bill has reached its stage one report. I would also like to echo the convener's comments in thanking those who have given evidence and um, particularly, especially mention the warm welcome that the committee received on its visit to Orkney this year. In Orkney, I was struck in speaking to the stakeholders about how much cooperation, cross-party partnership working was evident and how important this was to a very unique challenge of the islands, um, which had an ancient historic landscape, also capacity issues um, that were sometimes conflicting in terms of the priorities from the island in terms of tourism and, and um, conservation. Um, but I think this whole idea of the partnership working and cooperation is absolutely key to, to the bill, um, is key in the strategy. And I think um, none more so when actually um, in page 10 and 11 of the strategy, it looks at the cross-cutting strategic priorities of the government in terms of its whole whole um, priorities for Scotland and places this bill very central to that in, in the policy mainstreaming um, of the Scottish Government in relation to this bill. I think I would also like to pay particular mention to the SNH Rangers that we met while we were in Orkney. Um, their praises were sung by everyone we met on the island from the RSPB to the local authority to Historic Scotland and I know that it's a part funding arrangement with SNH and Historic Scotland and seems to work particularly well on the island. 
and I was particularly interested in their tour of um, the Ring of Brodgar and, and when we visited Scarabri on our visit. We've received many briefings for this debate today, including from the Law Society of Scotland, the, S the Scottish Society of Antiquaries, and um, the Built Environment Forum Scotland, and we're thankful for those briefings too, which add to, to the whole um, debate and the background for this Stage 1 report. And I agree that with the convener that while on the face of it, this would seem fairly straightforward to bring together these two organisations, but the evidence of the, the, ev the evidence, the written um, evidence that we received and um, the, the sessions have, have highlighted that there are some concerns and some really important issues that we still need to, to um, discuss as this progresses. But I am confident that this is a bill that can meet the objectives and the general principles of the bill. And that key to this is um, the collaboration that's at the centre of it. And this is no more evident than in our place, our time, historic environment of Scotland strategy document. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, this is the first ever strategy for the, the historic environment in Scotland and in the opening of that it's um, the cabinet secretary states the strategy has been developed collaboratively by a wide range of organizations and specialists in the historic environment sector and beyond and it sets out a shared vision for our historic environment which is owned by the people of Scotland and that is critical the strategy does not belong to the government or any particular sector it is for everyone and we can play a part in helping to ensure it delivers positive outcomes for our historic environment. And I think this will be key to being at the heart of what, what we do as we go forward. This is an extremely important document and it sets um, the tone of the whole debate and how we move forward in this bill and um, the vision statement in it is particularly interesting in, in it. Where, where the aims are set out as understanding and investigating and recording our historic environment, the protecting and caring of the historic environment, and the valuing and the riches and the significance of our historic environment. And I think it is um, key to the whole way forward, and I look forward to moving through the bill as it progresses through Parliament. Many thanks. I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the Stage 1 debate of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. It's appeared to me for some time during the evidence sessions of the Education and Culture Committee and indeed this afternoon that there is, is uh, a, no groundswell of objection to the proposed merger of Historic Scotland and RCAMS. And obviously some will be uh, more enthusiastic than others, but I have no doubt that uh, Parliament will support uh, the principles of the Bill at decision time today. I think the critical issue uh, will be moving forward is how the Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government uh, respond to the concerns issues uh, that have been raised. There will be a need for a number of reassurances and points of clarification and uh, amendments required as, as we go forward. Um, I would echo um, thanks to the clerks of the committee for uh, their support with the bill and for arranging the opportunity to meet key stakeholders in Orkney regarding the bill. Orkney is an uh, area uh, that has many great historical sites and experts. That was a very worthwhile and helped raise a number of uh, questions and issues. For example, uh, we heard confusion from stakeholders about the exact uh, division of responsibilities in terms of the roles Historic Environment Scotland, Marine Scotland and Scottish Ministers will play in relation to the marine environment. As the committee report states, it appears that decision-making on submerged archaeological sites sit with Marine Scotland rather than Historic Environment uh, Scotland, yet the Historic Environment strategy uh, is to encompass underwater. So I'm sure we would all welcome um, some, some clarity from the Cabinet Secretary uh, on, on that issue. Uh, during our Orkney visit, um, the issue of local decision-making was also raised, and I know that other members have already mentioned that. Local groups there highlighted the need to guard against centralised decision making on the historic environment and I acknowledge what the Cabinet Secretary has said in, in, uh, in terms of the importance of local partnerships but I do think we need to consider as the bill progresses how we ensure that is underpinned and is um, uh, guaranteed. More generally there has been considerable discussion from witnesses uh, across Scotland uh, and by the committee on the issue of funding, how charitable status uh, could affect the new body and other uh, funding implementations. Uh, I have to say from a personal point of view, I have uh, not seen enough evidence to 
conclude fully what the impact financially will be on the new body and other organisations. I think we need to avoid making grand assumptions about whether or not shortfalls will be created uh, and if they will or won't be made up in this case as we don't have the evidence um, at the moment. I know what the Cabinet Secretary uh, said about uh, funding earlier on, uh, but I do think we need to look at this uh, further in terms of financial implications. Um, yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. If, if I could reiterate in relation to the financial provisions um, for the bill that uh, it's not reliant on charitable status and indeed the assumptions that have been made have very, been very strict in terms of its bias, but it's not reliant on any additional income from charitable, for, for charitable income. I think, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. I, I, I'm, you know, I've obviously kind of making the point that I think we need to look at this further in terms of all the possible uh, scenarios and the implications that that, that could have. And, and also in terms of finance issues, I know the Scottish Government can, cannot currently give us an estimate of the repairs and maintenance needed for properties under its care. Uh, and I believe um, a, an urgent survey should be carried out to ascertain the backlog of repairs and liabilities for the existing properties it has responsibility for. And that, should happen before the planned date um, of April uh, 2015. Um, there's also been concerns raised, um, as other members have said, about the potential conflict of interest that the new body could have. Um, witnesses have been right to raise these issues. Um, and um, whether or not this is a new issue, uh, it still has been on, of ongoing concern to a number of witnesses uh, and one that we should take on board. And I think we need to further need to consider this issue as well as the bill progresses and I hope the Scottish Government will continue to respond to any such concern, concerns going uh, forward uh, with the relevant stakeholders. As I said earlier, I support the general principles of the bill, uh, but I hope the Scottish Government can now provide the clarity, assurances um, and amendments to address the issues and concerns raised by stakeholders, experts and organisations who really work so hard to improve our historic environment. Thank you. I'm afraid I have to reiterate there's no time available and interventions must be within the members' four minutes. Mike McKenzie to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm not a member of the Education and Culture Committee, but I am pleased to speak in this debate because I spent much of my previous career renovating, repairing and maintaining old buildings. Indeed, I live in a 250-year-old listed building. And I've worked with lime, putty mortar and horsehair, plaster and stone and slate. And I'm pleased that I was able over 35 years and more to help build some new life into some old buildings. And even now, I can't, can't pass by a forsaken and neglected old building. And there are still far too many of these across Scotland without feeling the urge to gather up my tools and gather together some skilled craftsmen and talk some money lender into helping finance its renovation. But much as I love these older buildings, much as the poor state of our historic environment saddens me, much as I value them, despite and perhaps because of all this, I still think people are more important. Because it is people, presiding officer, that inhabit our buildings. It's people that breathe life into them. And in our old buildings, it's their stories, the life and times of the people who use these buildings that echo in their walls. And it's people too, as the Cabinet Secretary has touched on, that care for our buildings. And that's why I welcome this bill and the formation of the new body, Historic Environment Scotland, and the first ever Historic Environment Strategy, because some new thinking and a new approach and culture is required. You can list a building, you could perhaps even double and treble list it, but you can't prevent apathy. You can't easily prevent neglect and eventual ruin, and you can't easily legislate to provide value. You only have to look at the Civic Trust's Buildings at Risk Register to find compelling evidence of this, for it's a sad and lengthy catalogue of neglected listed buildings, most of them quietly decaying. And you can schedule a monument and that will not prevent its neglect. And if anybody seeks evidence of this, visit Keel Chapel in Dura, the last resting place of James of the Glen, wrongly hung for the Arp and murder, inspiration for Robert Louis Stevenson's international bestseller, Kidnapped. Visit Keel Chapel to see that scheduling monuments 
in itself offers no protection whatsoever. But you can, however, facilitate, you can educate, and you can advise, and you can do so effectively, both conserving and enhancing. Queensbury House, I think, offers a very good example of a building both conserved and enhanced. And I have to beg to disagree with the Law Society here. You can do both. They're not mutually incompatible. In finishing, presiding officer, I'm glad that the Education and Culture Committee chose to visit Orkney in pursuing its scrutiny of this bill. Few places have more effectively added value to their built heritage, making it a driver of the local economy and creating what I think is a very virtuous circle. I hope that Historic Environment Scotland understand that as successful, thriving communities like Orkney that are required to nurture and care for our older buildings and our heritage. And I, I hope that they're able to successfully spread this knowledge and understanding right across Scotland. Many thanks. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, yesterday, thanks to the Prince's Trust, I had the opportunity to try my hand at stone masonry, but uh, to all in the historic environment, uh, I can assure you I will not be taking those skills out into the field. Can I uh, add my thanks to colleagues, to the clerks and to the witnesses who gave evidence uh, to the committee? Can I uh, pay particular gratitude to my constituents in Orkney for hosting an excellent visit last month and special mention to the county archaeologist, uh, Dr Julie Gibson, as well as arranging fine weather that showed off the islands uh, at their best, prompting one or two colleagues, I think, to consider putting in for political asylum. Our hosts managed in the space of a day to give a real flavour of how the historic environment can shape the identity of a community and deliver significant value in terms of tourism, uh, academic research, and even the sort of quality of life that encourages people to want to live and work in such a special place. As the convener indicated, the principles of the bill were unanimously supported, but there were a number of issues raised with us at stage one, and we'll wish to reflect these uh, in the bill or in the undertakings from the minister during stage two. Let me briefly touch on some of those. Uh, in terms of the definition of historic environment, the committee, I think, came to the conclusion that on balance there were more downsides than upsides in including this in the bill, but I recognise there is still strong support for inclusion. We do need to ensure that there is legal certainty and that safeguarding and promoting the historic environment does not suffer in comparison to other government priorities through a lack of specific reference in the bill establishing HES. The Law Society makes some useful comments with regard to the functions of HES, drawing attention to the fact that there is no function that promotes the maintenance of the historic environment and suggesting that this needs to be more explicitly stated in the bill. And I would add that greater clarity is also needed around HES's involvement in in relation to submerged archaeology and the work in the marine environment. The, I'm going to struggle. Maybe you pick it up in the, in the concluding remarks. The Law Society also raised the vexed issue of charitable status in their briefing, pointing to potential conflicts of interest. Others in the sector, notably the National Trust, were very anxious about a diversion of charitable funding away from others in the sector. Now, while this will be a decision for the HES Board, and the committee did come to the conclusion there were likely to be no new potential conflicts, I don't think we're out of the woods here yet on this issue. It's likely to be the basis of amendments at stage two. A number of witnesses have also emphasised the need for good collaboration between all stakeholders, something we saw uh, in Orkney, but in particular the critical relationship between HES and local authorities. Again, this may be something that needs to be strengthened through stage two. That local national uh, division of responsibility was a key message to come out of the visit uh, to Orkney. Quite rightly, my constituents were adamant that merger to create HES should not, must not, lead to a more centralised uh, approach. While national standards and consistent quality are vital, so too, as Patricia Ferguson, Liz Smith and others have said, so too is the capacity for the organisation to respond to local circumstances and to take decisions that reflect that. Like Patricia Ferguson, I would prefer to see those safeguards in the bill, but I do welcome welcome the Minister's comments uh, at the committee on this issue. Finally, on resources and expertise, I fully appreciate that across Scotland we are yet to punch our weight in relation to the historic environment. However, as colleagues witnessed firsthand, this is not a charge that can be laid against those in Orkney. In seeking to improve the situation in other parts of the country, I would not, however, wish to see resources diverted away from meeting the needs and opportunities of somewhere like Orkney. This is important, of course, for my own constituency, but I believe it is also crucial for Scotland as a whole. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, I put on record my gratitude to both uh, uh, the, the staff working in Historic Scotland and RCAMS, notably uh, the Rangers, as uh, Claire Adamson mentioned. I'm happy to confirm we'll be supporting the principles of the Bill. I very much hope that it can achieve its objectives, not least in ensuring that the value of our rich historic environment is properly recognised, enhanced and celebrated in the future. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Jane Baxter. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Of course, our place in time, the Historic Environment Strategy, was published in March and did lead on from the Scottish Historic Environment Policy Notes from over the years. And it was welcomed by all, is welcomed by all in the relevant sectors and many, many beyond. And now, of course, we're moving towards a new lead body through legislation, the Historic Environment Scotland. I'd like um, to, to note here some words about the Royal Commission of Ancient and Historic Monuments, which is going to be merged with Historic Scotland to create this new body. They have a, a proud history established in 1908, and there's been excellent work by the commissioners over the years, and of course all the staff that, that have worked to them. And I'm glad that Mike McKenzie mentioned Queensbury House, because the reality is, if it hadn't been for Commissioner John Hume from Arkham's, uh, Queensbury House would not look as it does at the moment, because he was instrumental in the history of the house and the building environment in Edinburgh at that time to make sure that we brought Queensbury House back to its original form as far as possible. So, among other many other credits that was done, surveying and recording and excellent uh, community outreach work and education work. So, I hope that as we move ahead through this, that legacy will be cherished and, and sustained. And as chair of the cross-party group on architecture and the built environment, we did have an excellent session on, the session on the subject of Scotland's historic environment. And that's why I'm able to say with confidence that the relevant sectoral organisations and many professionals welcome this strategy and the related proposed legislation. Uh, however, it is only stage one, and it's only right uh, that issues or potential issues get flagged up at this point. And, and I'm grateful to the work of the Royal Town, Pl Town Planning Institute of Scotland and the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, who very much have raised the same points. Um, first of all, looking at uh, the role of the body as part of the planning system in fulfilling its functions and protecting, managing, conserving and enhancing the historic environment. Greater clarity for planning authorities on the role of the new body and indeed clarity for the new body and the roles and responsibilities of the local planning authorities, and this leading into uh, community planning as well. The Society of Antiquaries has, has suggested there should be an explicit recognition of the advisory and supportive relationship that I've mentioned there, and ensuring that local authorities have access and take due regard of appropriate information and professional advice. And that leads on to, as well, the uh, maintaining and developing of the historic environment skills, including the traditional skills and crafts that Mike McKenzie mentioned. And of course, Historic Scotland have always been very good at the work they have done with SDS and apprentices to make sure that historic skills, building uh, traditional skills and crafts are maintained. And it, it is the case, in fact, that the stated priorities underpinning this legislation and strategy are informed decision-making skills and capacity and ensuring capacity. So knowledge and expertise uh, appropriate, appropriately placed are absolutely essential. Uh, I've got so much more I could say about this, but I know I have to be quiet. So what I would say is I can bring this up as we go through this whole process but I think what must underpin everything is that having the strategy is good, but it's not the having it, it's the implementing it that will really make the difference. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Jane Baxter to be followed by George Adam. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was pleased to be part of the committee which considered this bill, although I was unable to join fellow members on their fact-finding visit to Orkney. And I'd like to add my thanks to all those organisations and individuals who contributed to the committee's evidence sessions and made such thoughtful submissions, which I hope they feel have been recognised in the report. 
It is a testament to Scotland's heritage that members today are able to reflect on so many areas of historic and cultural importance within their own constituencies and regions. Being privileged to represent the region of Mid Scotland and Fife, I am certainly spoilt with the wealth of sites which I could focus on, from ancient buildings and monuments across the region to more recent examples like the Category B listed fire station in Dunfermline, soon to be reborn as a community-based arts centre operated as a social enterprise with support from the Council and other funders. And in previous debates, I have been able to highlight the Isle of May with its 8,000 years of human habitation through to the more recent history of Lochore Village, which has seen the local landscape change from agriculture to coal mines and burning bings and nowadays is home to the peaceful secret gem which is Lochore Meadows Country Park. And the pride of members in their local area points to a key issue which was raised in the committee report about the importance of continuing a regional approach, as currently pursued by Historic Scotland, to supporting the sites of interest in local communities. The Cabinet Secretary provided assurance that the new body would not mean a move to a more centralised approach to decision making, but I would particularly support the report's recommendations that the legislation before us underpins this in some way. Perhaps this is something the Cabinet Secretary could consider as the Bill progresses. As the Cabinet Secretary and her colleagues will know from recent questions I have asked on the issue, I have a strong interest in community planning and I believe that community participation and ownership is fundamental to successfully delivering outcomes at a local level and that this should cut across all areas of government. Local people care about their local heritage and local environment. The energy, expertise and commitment from local communities is something that cannot be replicated by governments or other agencies and which we sometimes do not adequately acknowledge or value. Civic pride is something you cannot put a price on. But that local drive and energy is often a thing that can bring communities together, helps to bring in the funding and ensures that the historic environment continues to be relevant now and in the future. The importance of community planning partnerships in this context has been highlighted by the Royal Town Planning Institute and I look forward to seeing their recommendations as part of the Historic Environment Group on this issue. The presence of COSLA on the Historic Environment Group demonstrates the recognition of the important role of local authorities in planning matters and the built environment. As the report highlights, some evidence to the committee has suggested that 92% of archaeological assets fall within the remit of planning authorities, as they are not explicitly labelled as scheduled monuments. The report highlights concerns over the remit of the new body in overseeing all of the historic environment, and this is therefore something on which I would welcome further clarification from the Minister. And we know it's not just sites of archaeological interest which are covered by this new legislation. It also includes properties in care and listed buildings, reflecting the diversity of the historic environment across the country. In supporting the general principles of this bill, while some aspects are particularly process-driven, given the nature of the legislation, it's vital that we remember the most important outcome, successfully protecting and managing our diverse historic environment for future generations. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now turn to George Adam, after which we'll turn to closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to thank all my colleagues and uh, everyone that gave evidence, as well as the clerks, uh, when we were going through this uh, stage one. It's been interesting and it's been exciting. It might sound surprising to say something like that, President Officer, when you're talking about the Historic Environment Scotland Bill proposes the merger of Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historic Monuments of Scotland and creating Scotland's uh, historic environment. Well, presiding officer, that's where it all... I could just sit down at this stage, and I know a lot of people might think that's a good idea, but uh, there is so much more to it, because at the same time as the bill was published, uh, Our Place and Time, Scotland's first ever historic environment strategy, was actually uh, launched as well. And that's the important part of all this, is the fact that this strategy, strategy will show the way forward for how we deal with this. As the Cabinet Secretary quite rightly says in the foreword, our heritage is hugely inspirational, helping to create a powerful sense of place, providing the backdrop to where we live, where we work and have fun. Our historic environment is a huge role to play in shaping a bright future in Scotland and it is up to us to ensure that it is passed down with pride to benefit of future generations. And I think that sums up this whole uh, uh, debate we're having here today because I think that's an important part of the, is the strategy and how we, our convener already said at some points that there may be some areas that are punching well above their weight and with some of the evidence that we actually re received that's probably true but I think the strategy gives us the opportunity to actually make sure that Linda Fab 
Fabiani said, make sure that we actually have the strategy working in all the areas throughout Scotland. You know, I could see in Orkney quite clearly uh, that it was working well, and uh, you could see the, the experience that they have with all the local authority and all the groups all working together to ensure that they do that. And our day in Orkney was special, both with the weather and seeing part of the country that, uh, that I've never seen before as well. I even had the situation where the Ring of Brodga, I managed to photobomb uh, an ancient monument when Stuart Maxwell, our convener, was taking a picture. So uh, not many people can make that claim to fame. But also at the same time when we were there with Scarabray, you know, I, I was talking to Liam MacArthur when we were walking down at Scarabray, and they show you the various time points uh, within from the, the, the centre as you get to the village itself, which is some 3,100, it was 3,100 BC, around that time where it was meant to have actually started now. I was saying to how about in Paisley we have this 850-year-old uh, abbey, and then when Liam showed me where that actually is, in the great scheme of things. My 850 years ain't a lot of time in this planet when compared to everything else. But it was interesting to see that we obviously all have, as uh, has already been mentioned, uh, uh, we all have, by Jane Baxter, we all have uh, things in our area. And this is where it comes down to the debate of how the historic environment, a definition, how can you define the, define this, uh, the, uh, the, envi the historic environment? Because it's fluid. In my opinion, it's pretty fluid. What is part of that historic environment now wouldn't have been maybe 20, 30 years ago. And in my own town, you've got former mill buildings, which were older buildings, which were just industrial buildings at their time. But now they are regarded as built buildings of great beauty and uh, architecture prowess. And these things have got to be retained and used because they're an integral part of who you are, who the town is and what makes us Paisley Buddies. And that's the same in every single community throughout Scotland. And I think that is the exciting part of the idea of the historic environment. The fact that you can actually, let's not contain it, let's not box it in to a situation where we just say that's what it is and it doesn't move from there. I think that's part of the exciting part of this bill is that we can actually continue to move it on and push, find a way to ensure that we can save this for everyone in the future. So in closing, presiding officer, I think this is a good start for us all to work together for this bill. And it's not just about merging two bodies, it's an exciting part of our future. Many thanks. We now turn to closing speeches and a call on Mary Scanlon. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As my colleague Liz Smith stated earlier, uh, we all support the rationale behind this bill. Uh, our place and time, the new historic environment strategy, has been warmly received by the sector, at least in theory, uh, and stakeholders have signalled their broad content with the proposed merged body. But I did think that Linda Fabiani made a very good point when she emphasised that it was about that what happened in implementation rather than simply the words contained. However, as Councillor Harry McGuigan of Cosla told us uh, on the committee, uh, and I quote, the devil is in the detail, and there are various issues which still require to be addressed, many of which have been raised today. Uh, but perhaps the most significant revolves around how we ensure how local decision-making is preserved, a point raised by Liam MacArthur and very, very firmly put to us by people across Orkney. And while there are good reasons for designating Historic Environment Scotland as the sector's lead body, we must ensure that this new entity advises in a manner which preserves and hopefully strengthens local decision-making. And again, this relates to local government, which I have to say again was made very clear uh, on our visit to Orkney. Um, but any uh, shift towards greater centralisation would be to the detriment of the historic environment. And while I note the assurances by the Cabinet Secretary, the assurances she's given this, in this area, it would seem to be sensible to make these intentions more explicit, perhaps in accompanying guidance. And then there's the relationship with the private sector. And I think it's fair to say that, on the whole, Historic Scotland has enjoyed a very good working relationship with the private heritage sector. And this is something that we hope will continue. Private owners have a huge stake in Scotland's historic environment, and we should recognise this as such, especially as they meet restoration costs from their own pockets. And on the broader point of ministerial direction, 
Uh, while all non-departmental public bodies must have a working relationship with central government, Section 12 of the Bill does read rather broadly. In particular, concerns have been raised about curatorial independence, and earlier Liz Smith raised exactly this point, and I associate myself with her remarks. Uh, put simply, it wouldn't, would not be acceptable for the Scottish Government to exert a higher degree of control over Historic Environment Scotland. So further assurances uh, about how any difference of opinion would be resolved would be very helpful as we take this bill forward. Another area of contention relates to funding. And uh, I noted with interest the figures National Trust for Scotland and the Historic Housing Association supplied to the committee about their property maintenance backlogs, which, when added together, amounted to over £100 million. Unfortunately, comparable figures for Historic Envi Environment Scotland will not be available until next April. And as Stuart Maxwell said in uh, his opening remarks as convener of the committee, um, it is important that the Scottish Government confirms who will ultimately be responsible for meeting the maintenance property for the significant 345 properties in care. Whoever that may be and whatever the final total, uh, it does seem that the new body will have to raise significant levels of additional finance uh, and uh, there is some concern that this could clash with the broader regulatory role that Historic Environment Scotland must have its, at its core. A final point relates to accountability. While our place and time commands the wide support of the sector, as it stands, we have no indication of who will be tasked with ensuring that outcomes are met. And while I wholeheartedly agree with the emphasis placed on collaboration, I think we all do, if these outcomes are to be realised, we do need direct lines of accountability. Of course, all of these points can be resolved as the Bill continues its progression. And fundamentally, the rationale for the merger is sound. The strategy is an important document which should go a long way to strengthening the sector. Sector, and it's for these reasons that we welcome stage one of this report. Thank, Thank you very much. Now, call Patricia Ferguson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been a very interesting, if short, debate, um, and it has been particularly interesting to hear the comments of colleagues on the committee, as they obviously have, have had the, the work of um, taking this forward, but also the interesting task of listening to the witnesses who have come forward, the evidence that's been submitted. And I have to say I'm particularly jealous that they were able to visit Orkney and have the uh, experience that they have had. Um, it is something to be seen, uh, and if uh, anyone in the chamber has not been, they should, they should go very quickly. And I'm sure Mr MacArthur would be happy to make those arrangements. But Mr Maxwell does well to challenge us as members to champion our local historic environment um, because it is about our sense of place and it is about the kind of communities that we represent. In my own area, we have had some contrasting experiences, I have to say, with Mary Hill Borough Hall being a very successful regeneration of a historic building and one that is now put to very good community use. But on the other hand, Springburn Public Hall, a similar building, but one that also had lain derelict, as had Mary Hill for a number of years, um, was suddenly demolished over Christmas uh, a year and a half ago because it was in such a bad way. And, uh, you know, it can be a very difficult challenge to preserve and maintain buildings of historic value, but I think we have to give more consideration to ways in which we can intervene at an earlier stage. And hopefully the new body will be able to do that and will be able to give good guidance and very strategic guidance to local authorities to help them to assist the owners of such properties. And Linda Fabiani was absolutely correct to reference the uh, history of Queensbury House and also particularly the involvement of John Hume in that, as in so many other 
projects of that kind across Scotland during his involvement. His dedication to this issue is probably second to none. And I very much remember the early days of this Parliament on the corporate body having very long discussions and debates about whether or not we should have slate on the roof of Queensbury House and whether it should be painted or lime washed. Um, I definitely think the lime wash was the right idea and I really haven't a clue as to whether or not the slates were. But the building is wonderful and an asset to this building. We've heard a little bit about ministerial direction this afternoon, and that is one of those interesting areas. And if I can be slightly flippant for a moment, I think ministerial direction is one of those things that is opposed in opposition, but adopted in government. And I speak from some experience in this area. But seriously, I think that the point is to get the balance right. And I was very interested in the point that the Cabinet Secretary made in response to a point made by Liz Smith um, about the Scottish Government's environmental uh, uh, priorities and how those would perhaps have a bearing on the historic environment. And I think actually that's a case in point because adaptations to buildings that might make it more environmentally friendly might also conflict or even compromise its heritage status. So those kinds of issues, I think, go to the heart of how ministerial direction could be used. And frankly, in a case like that, one would need to have the wisdom of Solomon, but hopefully with the right advice and the right briefing from the experts, the right decision would uh, be come to. And of course, it has been said, and I would agree with this very much, that the continued use of our historic buildings is in itself an environment, uh, environmentally friendly act, and perhaps even one of the best forms of recycling that we have. But I think, too, that it's important, as the committee has suggested, that we explain in more detail the um, bill's implications for the curatorial independence of the body. And perhaps as we go forward, those are elements that can be teased out. Um, I think, too, that um, the Society of Antiquities had a very interesting point to make about those delegated powers. They have a concern, and I would be interested in the, the Cabinet Secretary's views in this, that those powers might lead to ministers delegating uh, some of the more profitable aspects of the body's work to other bodies. Now, I can't imagine that that's what the Cabinet Secretary means, but if it is a concern of uh, those with an interest in the area, a specific interest in the area, I think it would be very, very useful to have that kind of clarification. The, the strategy, Our Place and Time, sets out the governance structure for the implementation of the strategy, and it's very welcome, and I think does that pretty well. But the Historic Environment, but historic environment Scotland, sorry, I'm finding it quite difficult to get used to the new name, and I wonder whether there isn't something more catchy we could call it, but perhaps that debate's gone. Um, but the strategy itself doesn't really talk about how the governance structure of the Historic Environment Scotland fits into the overarching strategy. In fact, there's scant mention of HES within that particular document. And I do think that that is something that perhaps could be uh, clarified as we go forward. Um, I very much look forward to the future discussions that we will no doubt have on this bill, and I'm sure there will be very interesting debates over amendments at uh, later stages. But for the moment, presiding officer, I think um, I would simply want to say that I very much welcome the work done by the committee. They've obviously taken this issue as seriously as it deserves to be, and uh, Scottish Labour will, of course, support the general principles of the bill when we uh, come to that point this evening. Many thanks. I now call on Fiona Hislip to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Uh, Presiding officer, I welcome the, the positive tone of the debate. I, I will explore all the constructive suggestions made this afternoon for improvement of the proposals, as well as the recommendations by the lead committee and by the delegated powers and law reform committee. I plan to write to the committee before recess and will include in that letter responses on the additional ideas discussed here this afternoon. Uh, but I can say here and now that I expect to be able to respond positively to the principles behind all of the committee's recommendations and 
and that I believe the bill and the accompanying dialogue with stakeholders will be that much stronger as a result. Uh, in my opening comments, I touched upon what seemed to be the key themes of the report, the committee's report. I believe the committee has accurately mapped the themes which matter. Uh, these themes include the relationship between the bill and the new body it creates and the sector-wide strategy, the benefits we believe the bill will bring about and how they will be monitored, the need for transparency and the importance of communities and the role of ministers. Um, the strategy is, of course, uh, collectively owned by all the independent bo bodies it part uh, who participate. Uh, my task as chair of the strategy's overarching forum, I'm calling that a forum rather than a board for clarity, will be to, pr to promote consensus. Uh, for it to work, it requires voluntary agreement. Uh, if we come to insuperable problems, we will need to work around them or approach them from a new angle. But to state the obvious, consensus only works if it remains uh, consensual. Historic Environment Scotland, on the other hand, will be a public body. Uh, it will be required to play a key role in delivering this government's contribution to the shared priorities agreed through the strategy. I can and I will hold HES to account through its chair for how it delivers. Uh, that is how all NDPBs work, and that is why we have chosen this model. But I do want to address the point about balance of ministerial direction raised by Liz Smith and reflected on by Patricia Ferguson in her closing remarks. Um, as Minister, I can't direct the strategy forum, but I can direct HES on strategic matters. I can direct HES on properties and care as they are Minister's responsibility, but I can't direct them on grant decisions, on listing and scheduling decisions, and importantly, on Patricia Ferguson's point, on their collecting decisions and on the curatorial matters uh, that she referred to. Uh, Liam uh, MacArthur referred to the point about functions, the Law Society saying there's no reference to the word maintain. Uh, but we do talk about protecting, managing, conserving, enhancing uh, and preserving. And conserving and preserve, preserving have specific meaning in heritage and I think we're well covered in that regard. Um, I do believe that the government has a duty to involve and um, support uh, communities, uh, both local uh, communities and communities of interest, in defining priorities and taking action. And that applies to the historic environment um, uh, as it does more widely. Uh, that is why we have a requirement in the bill for our new lead body to work in partnership. However, I have heard the contributions around the Chamber um, and I accept the Committee's view, reinforced in the debate, that the bill does not give sufficient providence to the role of local communities. Uh, we will address that um, as we move forward. Uh, Neil Bibby referred to uh, mar the marine environment. I would refer him to Schedule 4 of the bill. Uh, HES will act as a, an expert advisor to the Scottish Government uh, and will continue to its recording activities, but uh, the Scottish Government through Marine Scotland will undertake designation and consent. And this will maintain the unified marine uh, regulation system just recently introduced by the Marine uh, Scotland Act. Um, in terms of local authorities, uh, Patricia Ferguson uh, touched on the important, very important role of local authorities. Uh, they will uh, play and still play a, a fundamental role in looking after the historic environment, uh, both designated and uh, undesignated heritage. The bill itself does not change that fundamental role of local authorities and HES will be able to, however, support them uh, more effectively. Um, in terms of uh, the charitable status issues, I think it was Liam MacArthur raised the issue um, about charitable status and written evidence was received by the committee from Oscar who confirmed that a charity with regulatory functions was unusual but not unique. Uh, others include the General Teaching Council, for example, of Scotland and indeed the SSPCA. Uh, I've also uh, talk, talked about the support that is required and will continue, grants, advice, uh, training, skills. Um, I do think in terms of the body, it will still uh, carry out that function. I think Patricia Ferguson's point about reference on skills is one that I would want to consider further. There will be situations where a strong lead is needed, uh, whether in research or project management, and I particularly welcome the strong uh, working relationships which exist with the National Trust for Scotland, for example, which demonstrates the collaboration that we can achieve. Uh, for example, we need to no, look no further than the new Bannockburn Centre, delivered on time and within budget in cooperation with the National Trust for Scotland. Shared projects which make the best use of talents regardless of how they are badged will simply be the, the best way forward in many regards as we move uh, into the future. One very important shared project has been in existence for a century uh, but has been redefined by the Bill. Uh, Historic Scotland cares for and represents uh, to the public the many uh, properties in state care. Uh, in future, ownership and guardianship will remain with ministers but management and operation will be delegated to HES. 
We've chosen uh, that not because of a lack of trust in the staff who already care for these properties so well. Um, rather, we recognise the direct commitment to our predecessors um, that have been given to those who have passed these properties into state care. Now, that special relationship will be reflected in a careful design for the scheme of delegation, um, which will be published before it comes into effect. Performance against that scheme will be monitored and results published. Of course, conservation is a never-ending task. And although we have no immediate plans to do so, we also uh, provide in the bill for ministers to be able to delegate the management of historic properties to bodies other than HES. We believe there may be situations in the future that that might be appropriate. But in the reference to the point about the Society of Antiquaries, we are happy to accept the Delegated Powers uh, Committee recommendation of close scrutiny of any proposal that a body uh, would uh, require to take. And we plan to bring forward an amendment at stage two requiring that any such body will be specified by order with affirmative parliamentary procedure so this parliament would have a, a, a response to that. Uh, I will respond uh, to, uh, uh, the to, to the committee on the particular points that have been raised uh, in this debate and in the, in the report. Um, we will have a better body going forward to lead us into uh, the future in regard to management of the historic environment and leadership. Um, I want to close by making two points. I thought Mike McKenzie and George Adam gave very passionate and well-informed contributions. Um, I also think that Stuart Maxwell, in his remarks, he gave us all a challenge. How do we, as MSPs, help lead the historic environment? And I would like to commend in particular Graham Day, who has personally taken responsibility to try and galvanise the community, heritage and local community in our growth centred around a growth abbey. And I think Stuart Maxwell's challenge to us all is well made. And finally, uh, can I agree with the Labour Party? We don't always agree with the Labour Party, uh, but Patricia Ferguson, who's made a very fine and informed contribution this afternoon, um, instructed the, the Chamber that we should travel to Orkney as soon as possible. Well, I'm delighted to report to Patricia Ferguson I will be a flight on a flight to Orkney tomorrow morning oh, <laughs> as, 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 as I attend the St Magnus Festival, and I follow in the footsteps of the committee, who obviously had such a wonderful visit to Orkney, where we can celebrate um, our heritage and see where partnership with the local community really works and I think demonstrates the wonderful heritage that we have, how, uh, we have uh, both in the built environment but also I think in the intangible in terms of the performances that I see there. I know Patricia Ferguson would want to know if we have an extra seat to go with me and I, I will see what I can do for Patricia Ferguson. Thank you. Uh, I've got two points of order, James Dornan. Officer. As a member who treats his role as a member of the Public Audit Committee extremely seriously, I'm asking you for guidance on the comments made at FMQs today by the Leader of the Opposition, Joanne Lamont, where she appeared to malign the integrity and impartiality of the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission of Scotland and the members of the Advisory Board. I would be amazed if anyone else considered people such as Jackie Brock from Children in Scotland, Phil Jackson from EIS, Eileen Pryor, Scottish Parent Teaching Council, and the representatives of three Labour-run authorities, Sarah Ells and Gordon Wardrop from Fife Council, Moira Niven from West Lothian Council, and Maureen McKenna of Glasgow City Council as being part of some conspiracy to make the Scottish Government look good. President Officer, I have never had the pleasure to meet a number of those mentioned, but I know Maureen McKenna. Maureen and I have had a number of differences yes, of opinion over the years. Yes, but can we just get to the point, Mr Dornan? Three minutes. Get to the point, I'm Mr Dornan. I'm to the Dornan. point, President Officer. Maureen and I have had a number of differences of opinion yes, over the years. Yes, but I'm still waiting for you to get to your point. I, 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 sorry, President Officer, do I not have three minutes? The same as Mr. Else Dornan, does. sit down. Sit down. Please come to your point as quickly as possible. Yes, President Officer. Not once in all my dealings with Maureen McKenna did I think she was anything but honest and trustworthy. And that takes me on to the Auditor General. We in the Public Audit Committee rely Mr. on. Dornan, uh, Mr. Dornan, could you just sit down? Sit down. This is not a speech, it's a point of order. Can you tell me what your point of order is and what you wish me to do? President Officer, I'm looking for advice, and that's the point I'm coming to. In the Public Audit Committee, we rely on and believe. <laughs> what is it? That you we rely on and believe in the veracity and impartiality of the Auditor General and the, the re reports that she puts in front of us. We may sometimes disagree slightly with the emphasis or outcomes, 
but to my knowledge, we have always believed that these reports were written without fear or favour by the Auditor-General. Ms Lamont's comments today suggest that we were wrong to do so and that the Auditor-General is capable of being manipulated by politicians. Presiding officer, it is my contention that these comments were unworthy of this Parliament and the office that Ms Lamont holds. I would hope that she would reconsider these comments and apologise to the Auditor-General, Maureen McKenna and all the others she has so unfairly traduced. However, presiding officer, that is a matter for her. The guidance I ask from you is what protection is there for individuals or organisations from potentially reputationally damaging statements from MSPs in this Parliament. Thank you, Mr Dornan. I am um, sure that members will be well aware, because I said repeatedly in this chamber, that it is not for the presiding officers to res uh, respond on a ruling on veracity of members' contributions in the chamber. That is a matter for them. If you are concerned about the exchange today at FMQs, and in particular you are concerned about the Public Audit Committee, can I suggest that you write to the Public Audit Committee and ask them to look at the matter? Mr Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. Um, at question time today, the First Minister was asked about the Daily Telegraph news story, which said he had been presented with a report by civil servants on the cost to set up an independent country. I asked the First Minister to confirm if there was nothing in the Daily Telegraph report that is true. He told me the report has one snippet of truth. It says officials met Professor Patrick Dunleavy. Yes, they did. They were there with me when I met him. However, after question time, the First Minister's press team held a briefing meeting where they revealed that a second element of the story was true that the First Minister had received a report from civil servants on the set-up costs. There will be two issues that will be of concern to you, Presiding Officer. I will be brief. The first is that we have the First Minister saying one thing in this chamber and his official spokesman saying something completely different that is contradicting the First Minister. We've only got 12 days left sitting in this Parliament. Time is running out for the answers that we want. Has the presiding officer received any indication from the First Minister that he wishes to make a statement to correct what he said today? No, Mr Rennie, I have had no such indication. But can I say uh, to Mr Rennie, as I have just said to Mr Dornan, as I have said on innumerable times in this chamber, that what a member says in this chamber is not a matter for me and the presiding officers do not rule on veracity. And I am also not responsible for what the First Minister or anybody else's press officers say out with this chamber. We now move to decision time. The next, the next item of business is consideration of motion number 9869 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. I call on Fiona Hislop to move the motion. Formally moved. Question this motion will be put decision time. The next question is that motion number 10371 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9869 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Historic Environment Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The final question is that motion number 10335 in the name of David Stewart on the Building's Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to and the Building Recovery of Expenses Scotland Bill is passed. Congratulations, Mr Stewart. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.